Good morning, everybody. Aloha. Um, most of you that have attended many of these sessions know me by now. My name is Rob Hack. My company is Insight Inter Asia. I help uh, U.S. companies sell into Asia. I'm on the board of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, or HPEC, and that is a local nonprofit headquartered here in Honolulu. And our mission is to teach small companies, medium-sized companies, about exporting topics. And we have a generous grant from DBET, which allows us to put on this series of seminars, which you're here today, on intellectual property for exporters. So uh, first up, we'll have Jamie Lum will say a couple of words um, about DBET, but then I'd like to uh, introduce very quickly our esteemed panel. I'll just go this way. This is Jaina Uehara from the Business Action Center here in Honolulu under BREG. We have um, John Kabeka from the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, uh, based in San Jose. And uh, Dan Brownstone from the American Intellectual Property Legal Association? Law Lawyer Law Association, thank you. Uh, you're based in New York. And Sarah Smith, CEO of Rappoli. Um, you'll learn more about her company later, but she's one of our featured entrepreneurs uh, of the day. And uh, uh, she makes custom, eco-friendly wrapping paper. Fantastic product. Um, and then on the end, Seth Reese from Watanabe Ing. He's our local patent attorney, or I should say IP attorney, that we've uh, brought in to speak today so you have local resources to fall back on. Coming from the airport is also Mitzi Toro, who is the Maui cookie lady. Uh, hopefully she brings some samples. Um, she has uh, a fantastic uh, small factory on Maui uh, in Kihei, and she makes cookies and sends them all over the place, and they're fantastic. Uh, so with that, let me bring up real quickly um, Jamie Lum from DBET to say a few words about the High Step program. Aloha, good morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here. Uh, as Rob uh, mentioned, um, we do have a program called the Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program, or High Step. Um, and we are able to put this program on uh, because of a grant from the Small Business Administration. So with this, um, the purpose of the STEP program, which is a nationwide program and uh, it's a competitive um, grant across the U.S. that all states and territories can apply for. Um, the whole purpose of, of this grant uh, that was, um, uh, has been in effect since about 2011 is to increase exports, U.S. exports. So uh, with that, uh, we are trying to encourage our Hawaii companies to expand their um, markets by looking at exports as a way to increase their, um, uh, their sales and uh, for those that are already exporting to expand even further. So with the funds, um, we have basically three parts of our high-step program, which is our export readiness training, of which this seminar is part of that. And um, we do work with our partners, uh, HPEC and the Small Business Development Center. Joe Burns and his people are here. Uh, Innovate Hawaii, which is under the Hawaii, Tech, um, Hawaii Technology Corporation. Um, and uh, with the Mink Center, uh, we put on seminars and we also offer through our partners business advising, one-on-one uh, -on -one business advising. So uh, we encourage companies to come to these, um, these very informative seminars as well as um, to sign up on our website. And our website, by the way, is invest.hawaii.gov. And if you look under the exporting tab, you'll see all the information on the High Step program. And that is where you can fill in um, a registration form and be put into our system and um, be put into contact with some of our um, uh, business advising partners. So export readiness is one component. Another component is our um, Hawaii uh, pavilions. Uh, what we do, DBED does, is that we um, organize um, groups of companies to go into particular uh, trade shows um, under the Hawaii umbrella, and um, and we subsidize the majority of the cost for that. There is a, a, a fee for companies, but it's a um, hopefully a significantly reduced uh, amount for companies to be able to afford to go into these trade shows. Um, our upcoming 
we have uh, our big show in September, which a lot of people um, are very interested in, which is the Tokyo International Gift Show. We also are doing the outdoor retailer in July. Again, if you go to our website, you'll see the calendar. We also have a hard copy printed, um, and it's outside on the desk. Um, so that's our Hawaii pavilions. And then lastly um, is our uh, company assistance program, of which um, companies can apply for a small amount of money to help them uh, to implement their export development plan uh, the funds have already been given out for 2018, and so we are hopeful that we'll be successful in receiving another grant, um, which we just received notice that the uh, grant period is, uh, the grant application is, is of, uh, due in a couple of weeks. So hopefully we'll be successful, get more money, and we'll have some more funding for 2019. So in a nutshell, that's high step. Um, again, invest.hawaii.gov under the exporting tab will give you more information. Um, I do have my cards outside as well as my colleague Mark Ritchie. We both, um, well, the entire staff helps out on this program. But um, again, thank you for all um, being here this morning. And um, uh, if you have any questions, we'll be around. Mahalo. Thank you, Jamie. One other point I should make. Uh, for all of our seminars, you see lots of cameras around here. We have the live audience, which is you. We're streaming this by webinar to the neighbor islands. So we have many attendees online here that are watching this through a separate camera. And then we record all of our videos and put them on our YouTube channel later after some magical editing by Mr. Doug here. So please look at our YouTube channel. I just want to show you this later so you can see uh, some of our past uh, seminars that are all up here. We recently had a very good one on scaling up operations, e-commerce for exporters. Uh, uh, I was praying I was wearing a different shirt. Um, anyway, that's... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Marketing in Japan was a very good event. Nonetheless, all of our past uh, webinars and seminars are up here, so please look for that. The other point being a quick disclaimer that um, because we're recording this and it's going out by live stream, any questions you ask are part of a live forum here. Please understand that. And any answers that the uh, panelists give later uh, are also part of that live forum. And your face may appear, although unlikely, in the video. So with that, can I bring up, please, uh, John Kabeka and um, Dan Brownstone. They're going to go through a presentation that they prepared on um, USPTO topics. And um, we will have a, just a couple minutes at the end of each presentation for questions, but let's leave the bulk of the questions till the very end, please, if possible. But if there's a burning question, please go ahead and ask it at the end of each presentation. Thank you. Come on up, guys. And just bear with me one second, because I have to share your presentation with the online audience. So okay, I can give my welcome while you're doing that. Hello, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Brownstone. I'm from um, uh, the World Intellectual Property Owners, uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and also the American IP Law Association, AIPLA. Uh, and I'm also a partner at a law firm in New York, Fenwick & West. But that's my day job. My, my job here is to welcome you to World IP Day. Uh, World IP Day is an annual event that happens on April 26th of each year. It's been happening since 2000, so this is our 18th year or 19th year. And the purpose of World IP Day is for everyone to get together, aspirationally, all over the world at the same time, plus or minus a couple of weeks, to talk about IP and to, exp and to help uh, facilitate discussions with people who are not IP practitioners about why is IP important? Why do we care about IP? Why should people just in their day-to-day -day lives care about trademarks, patents, copyright, trade secrets, those things? Um, and it's more than just don't pirate music and don't pirate software, which you shouldn't do. It's also about how do we foster innovation? How do we, in our case, how do we keep the US competitive? And, and, and what are the mechanisms in place by which we can do that? Um, every year, WIPO which is that the international organization picks a theme for World IP Day. And once they pick the theme, it flows down to the different countries. In the US, it's AIPLA. And this year, the theme is Powering Change, um, Women in IP. 
And it's a particularly timely theme given all of the um, attention that's been given to the Me Too movement and, and, and all of the, um, the headlines this year. And it's interesting, I was, John was just showing me some figures that, uh, that show that in 1995, women were named as inventors in patents only about 17% of the time. That's 20 years ago. And in 20 years, we've made significant progress. But still, a couple of years ago, 2015, only one third of patents, not even the full one third of patents, listed a woman as an inventor. So we still have a long way to go, even though we're making a lot of progress. And um, organizations like USPTO and AIPLA and law firms and law schools and the entire pipeline, I think, in the IP community have really taken to heart the importance of um, supporting STEM education at you know, the, the grade school level through um, professional schools and, and post-grad, and also in making grants available and um, providing resources, mentoring, mentee relationships, um, educational materials, et cetera, available to help women uh, become more active, in, not just in STEM, but in IP in general. So AIPLA is very happy to help with that. We're a, we're a trade organization of about 20,000 IP practitioners, both in law firms and in um, private practice and in corporations. And uh, through our public education committee, we sponsor the World IP Day events throughout the country. And um, sometimes we're lucky enough to partner with uh, the PTO like we are today. But they're all grassroots uh, events. And so without sponsors like we have today sponsoring this event, these events would never happen. So thank you so much to, to everybody, to Rob and everybody else who's here um, and who's made today possible. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Dan. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I, I definitely want to first start out by echoing uh, our gratitude on behalf of WIPO and the USPTO and the American Intellectual Property Law Association for all the work that went into um, like really bringing today's event into the fold and, and embracing the theme of uh, powering change uh, and, and celebrating women in creativity and entrepreneurship. Um, so. I have a video that I want to share, but before I do, I thought I would just you know, highlight some of the things that, that Dan mentioned um, when it comes to women in entrepreneurship and creativity, and how brilliant preserving, uh, per persevering women inventors and pioneers, how they play a critical role in maintaining our nation's scientific edge, improving our way of life, and enhancing our economic prosperity. Their work reminds us, and you'll hear from some of them today, but they remind us every day of the awe-inspiring power of intellectual property and the importance of the role that it plays in fostering economic development, job growth, and building a solid economy for a nation, if not the world. Um, creative women, like those inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame or laureates of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, they inspire us and help lead the next generation of innovators around the world. And uh, as you heard, Rob mentioned that my office is in San Jose, so the Silicon Valley USPTO is located in San Jose City Hall, and it's responsible for engaging with the communities in the seven western states of, of, the, of the country. And when you walk into our lobby, um, we have a, a wall of 16 inventors. We call them the catalysts of innovation. And those catalysts of innovation really, uh, I think, really do a great job of uh, epitomizing the diversity of technology, not just through race and gender, but across technology, across multiple technologies, and also across our very diverse region of the country. And one of those inventors that's highlighted up in the wall is Dr. Ellen Ochoa. And Dr. Ochoa is a astronaut. She is a patent holder. She's an engineer. She's also an astronaut. So we thought we would play a video today uh, so you can hear directly from Dr. Ochoa and the p impact that she has had on, on uh, women in entrepreneurship and creativity and in the STEM field. Just 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery on the first mission to dot orbiting international it is a really exciting ride, um, and uh, you're, at once you're trying to sort of experience the ride, but you're also paying attention 
to what's going on because you have to be ready at any second. The year before I went on this mission, I had been named to a presidential commission on the celebration of women in American history. So one of the things I thought of as, as I was going through this commission, knowing that I was going to be heading into space and that there were three women on the flight, was to get one of these flags from the National Women's Party that was used in the early part of the 20th century as women were fighting for the right to vote. So I was able to, to get a flag and to bring it with me into space and then to be able to unfurl it in the new uh, International Space Station. So it was an opportunity to be in the International Space Station with the three women on my crew and then with this flag from the National Women's Party, which uh, was so significant because of the part that it played in getting women the right to vote. Getting a patent wasn't something I'd ever thought about when I first went to graduate school or even, you know, probably most of the way through my research. But we got to a point where um, I think my main thesis advisor, uh, Professor Goodman, suggested that we talk to our, you know, patent and technology office uh, at Stanford. I certainly never thought of myself as an inventor, and I, I didn't go to graduate school to, to become an inventor or to, to get a patent. It really kind of came up as part of the process. I mean, there's so many different ways that invention and innovation are, are used in our society today. But it, it is a way that people can contribute um, from all walks of life. I never really thought about being a mentor to others until I was well into my career. And yet, I see college students who are wonderful mentors to high school students. I see high school students who are wonderful mentors to middle school students. I wish I had thought a little bit more about that when I was those ages, but you don't have to wait, you know, till you're older to really make an impact on other people's lives. And, uh, you know, I know myself how important it is to, to see somebody else doing that, that maybe you have something in common with or can relate to in some way. Um, it was certainly an inspiration for me when the first six women were selected for the astronaut program, and Sally Wright in particular, because she was a physics major like me, and because she went to Stanford, which is where I went for graduate school. And that helped me picture myself as an astronaut, which really seemed, you know, like such an impossible dream. So I know how powerful that can be. And if there's anything that I can do to help students, you know, just dream bigger dreams, have bigger goals, um, think about doing more than maybe they would have otherwise, then that's just hugely rewarding to me. You know, I think about how I draw inspiration for the women who came before me and how meaningful that is to me and to think that I might have that role in, in other women's lives uh, is just, I think it's just another gift that I've gotten from NASA uh, with what I've been able to do there. Okay, great. So. Thank you, Dr. Ochoa. Uh, it also uh, may be t completely coincidental, but her husband is an IP attorney. Um, so, <laughs> um, actually, uh, and she's from California originally, even though she runs the Johnson Space Flight Center in, uh, in Texas. Uh, and recently, a group of about 25 USPTO executives had an opportunity to go to the center as part of an executive development opportunity and, uh, and meet with her and also uh, meet with the le executive leadership cohort that they've created on site there. So really exciting experience. Um, what I thought I would do now is, as Dan mentioned, April 26th is the official day of, of World IP Day, so it is clearly not April 26th yet. Um, this is the first World IP Day celebration. It's actually first of four this week that I will be participating in, and Dan will be participating in them as well on the West Coast. Um, but it's above about 60 or 70 that are taking place across the country in the US, um, but in the, over the next three weeks. Uh, on April 26th itself, uh, there there will be an event in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill with the USPTO and some elected officials to promote uh, women in innovation and creativity even further. Uh, but as I close uh, this portion of the program, and again, look forward to, to coming up and talking to you about you know, building an IP strategy and the different types of, of intellectual property, um, I just wanted to share that you know, we, 
we at the USPTO take our jobs very seriously and we want to do whatever we can to support creators, inventors, and entrepreneurs as they define their ideas in the form of patents, trademarks, copyrights, or other forms of intellectual property as they need uh, to help protect their business ventures, their business strategy, and, um, and their success as, as, a, as a business owner. So with that, thank you again for inviting us here and look forward to the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, bear with me again while I bring up this uh, website uh, for our next speaker. I'm very happy to have her here. As I introduced her at the beginning of the meeting, this is Sarah Smith. She's the CEO of Rappley which makes some fantastic products. She can explain that. I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, but she's based on Maui. We thank her for flying in today just to be here to speak. She's uh, one of our featured female entrepreneurs, and I'd like you to welcome Sarah Smith. Oh, geez. Hi. It's such a treat to be here today. I'm normally, like, on the other end of a on the webinar sitting alone in my office, so eyeballs are great. Um, my name is Sarah, and like many entrepreneurs, my story started with a pain point. Um, for me, particularly, it was the burden over um, what I, uh, over the wasted gift wrap at the end of a party. I'm pretty mindful of reducing, reusing, recycling, and uh, our local recycling centers here in Hawaii won't accept wrapping paper. And so I became that person at the end of the party that was like, oh, we can save that. We'll smooth it out, roll it up, try to use it again. And um, that got pretty old. And I often in that process would lament, like, why can't we just take great patterns and use these local newspapers that are in every town in America and run the patterns on newsprint so that we could just recycle the paper at the end of the party with our newspapers? And basically, once I had that vision, I couldn't not act on it. Um, I rapidly was sort of a, this connecting of the dots in my life. Um, my grandfather was an immigrant and started a printing press in New York City with his brothers. And my father and his brothers went on to start their own printing press down south. Um, we moved to Hawaii when I was two. My aunt and uncle worked at Maui News. They're still there for <laughs> over 30 years, so I grew up in that press room. Um, and then my career path had taken me into magazine publishing, where I was learning more about digital files and um, print-ready um, files. And so I had, I had a vision for it. And at the encouragement of a friend and mentor, I took my idea and my concept to Honolulu's first startup weekend back in 2013. And I remember our, um, flying over from Maui for pitch night on Friday night, and I was like, I need a name. And so I'm like in Hawaiian Airlines jotting on napkins. And um, I just really wanted to create a gift wrap that people could feel good about. So the words that were coming to me were rap and happy. I was like, rappy rhymes with crappy. <laughs> so no, <laughs> we settled on rappily. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I mean, I wasn't the first one to do a newsprint gift wrap, but um, I was the only one to bring it to market. By the way, my team and I ended up winning that startup weekend. And that definitely gave me some wind under my sails to continue with the concept. And, so pursuing my trademark for Rappoli was one of the first things I did after I um, incorporated. And so, um, like I said, we weren't the first one to do newsprint gift wrap, but we were the only one to bring it to market and, um, in a way that we did. And um, so we got that. We were able to trademark Rappoli. And uh, to be honest, building Rappoli brand has been the most rewarding part of my job as a CEO. Um, it's a values-driven brand. And while we're devoted, our reason for being is eco-friendly, the smarter, more sustainable model for wrapping paper and bringing that to market, I didn't want our story, our brand story, to end there. So I worked really hard to um, 
layers on top of that. So we um, have this collaborative level where I work with independent artists for the great patterns that we print numerous times throughout the year. And um, I promote them, and I tell their stories, and I name them in all the patterns that we use. Um, I also collaborate with our consumers, our community base. I let them vote on patterns that they like. Um, we have a lot of feedback. Um, they, you know, I like them to have a voice in our design process. And, um, and then also a level of education. I mean, we're very committed to thoughtful sourcing and being mindful in um, our resources that we use, and then also what the end game is for those resources. How can they be put back into the system and used again? So um, the education component um, is definitely part of our communications and branding and towards the uh, consumer awareness uh, level. Uh, Rapidly is gonna be five years old this November, and uh, I'll say, you know, year one and two were definitely devoted to testing and iterating the product and our packaging, um, and also building out our wholesale line. <clears throat> um, year three and four, we're focused more on developing our e-commerce and strengthening that. These are all like new skill sets you can kind of, as an entrepreneur, have to put in your bucket. So for me, it was like logical to break them down and just, you know, you can't tackle it all at once year one. So you just, you know, slowly kind of bite off a chunk. And uh, this year, definitely um, very focused on expanding our exports, which has led me here and to this great group of people that I'm so thankful to be a part of with DBED, and um, also new product development in the eco gift wrap sector. So that's my story. Thank you very much. Oh. And this is the paper, by the way. It's a folded sheets just off the newspaper press, basically just like a newspaper. Thank you very much, Sarah. Isn't that a neat product? Um, we're going to hear more from Sarah later. And while uh, Sarah was speaking, the Maui cookie lady came in. No samples, though. Everybody here was waiting for samples. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, next, we'll have uh, John Kabeka will come back up and speak, uh, uh, continue his presentation on the USPTO and their efforts. Sure. And uh, Dan Brownstone is going to co-present with me as well. So uh, uh, what we'd like to do today is share with you uh, the different types of intellectual property, the importance of an IP strategy. Uh, we'll do a deeper dive on trademarks um, and and how to secure international trademark protection, uh, as well as a deeper dive on patents and the different types of patents. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, the, but, uh, but first, you know, let me just tell you a little bit about the USPTO. Uh, we have a new head of the US Patent and Trademark Office. He's been on the job now for about two months, Andre Iancu. He's our new undersecretary. Um, his title is actually quite long. It's Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the director of the US Patent and Trademark Office. So there's two titles in there. Um, as the director of the USPTO, uh, Director Iancu oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the agency, which includes the granting of patents and the registering and, of uh, trademarks. Um, the second half, or the first half of the title, the Undersecretary of Commerce for IP, uh, you know, the Undersecretary serves as the principal advisor to the President and to the Secretary of Commerce on all forms of intellectual property, not just patents and trademarks, but on trade secrets and copyrights and the enforcement of those rights as well. Uh, so we play a very active role in the executive branch. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of IP in a moment. Uh, and you can go to the next slide if you'd like. But uh, one thing to highlight is the Copyright Office is actually in the Library of Congress. Um, but which is in the legislative branch, but for the executive branch, the head of the USPTO serves as the principal advisor on the executive branch. So we work really closely with the Copyright Office on copyright matters as well. Um, so just a quick show of hands, any um, trademark owners in the room? We'll start there, all right, some good, all right, wonderful, awesome. So <laughs> and uh, uh, patent owners, all right, wonderful. Um, patent attorneys, I always have to call them out. Right. So <laughs> all right, I always have to, they keep me honest, so that's great. Um, 
Okay, so the, 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 the foundation of America's IP system is uh, you know, articulated in the Constitution in Article I, Section 8, Clause 3, uh, which really says to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Um, and so that's established the, the creation of the Patent Act in 1790, which led to the patent system and then followed by the, the trademark system that we, we all know and love today. Um, but if you go to the next slide, we have, these are the different types of intellectual property um, that are available. And so it's, there are different types of patents, there's copyrights, there's trade secrets, and trademarks. And what we thought we would do is go through these and then also talk about how the different types of intellectual property overlap. And they overlap, I think, very well, and for a particular reason. Uh, they overlap because there's no one-size-fits-all solution for any business owner, right? You may need to protect your brand, and that's great, but you may also be able to protect that brand through design patent, and we'll talk about that. Um, and your innovations you know, may be protected under a utility patent, or the actual form and what they look like would be a design patent. So there's all these different overlaps, and based on what your product is, what your business model is, what your intellectual property strategy is, um, each of these come into play for different reasons. So, um, so Dan and I are going to you know, chime, chime off each other and, uh, and chime in, I guess, uh, and talk about these different types of, of IP. And then, I, as I mentioned, we'll go into a deeper dive on trademarks and patents after we get through this slide. Um, so uh, hopefully Dan will also keep me on time because I've been known to spend an hour on this one slide, so we're, we don't have an hour. Well, um, we should for... also just say that this is, um, <laughs> this is uh, for the US. This chart applies in the US. There, is, there are international analogs to most of these concepts, but IP rights are territorial, they're national, so you have to pursue protection in all the different countries that you want protection in, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But this is a US specific slide. Thank you. Yep. Um, so let's, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. Uh, so we'll talk about trademarks. And trademarks are words, symbols, logos, designs that distinguish one product or service in the marketplace from other products and services in the marketplace. So really, it's the brand identifier. And so some examples um, that are provided up here are the Coca-Cola name, um, Pillsbury, Doughboy, Character. Um, those are types of trademarks because that's what represents the brand of that product. So if I had, and I usually have a bottle of Coca-Cola, but I don't today, but, but if, if you couldn't even see the label and you just saw the shape of the bottle, um, and clearly if I told you this was a Coca-Cola bottle, you would know that that's not true, right? Because you have, um, you can use the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, and Coca-Cola uses the shape of the bottle to distinguish its product from other carbonated beverages on the marketplace. So because of that, they can actually use the, the shape of a product in their trademark because they use the shape um, as part of its brand. Uh, and then similarly, if, I, if, if uh, you didn't see um, the words, but you saw the red label, you would probably guess it was Coca-Cola as well um, because Coca-Cola uses its label, uses its branding, again, as a way to, to uh, distinguish its product from other products in the marketplace. Anything you want to? Okay. We'll go into more details on trademarks. Um, Trade secrets are an interesting form of intellectual property because there's no trade secret examiner, right? We have copyright examiners, trademark examiners, and, and patent examiners, but there's no trade secret examiner. This is, this is a form of intellectual property that is privately held, and it's only of value to the company if the secret can be maintained secret. So the definition here is formula, methods, devices, or other compilations of information which is confidential and gives one business an advantage, right? It gives a business advantage. So it might be um, an algorithm in a search engine that, that may be kept as a trade secret. As long as nobody can hack in and, and, and um, pull that algorithm out of the software, you could protect it as a trade secret. Going back to Coca-Cola, a great example, Coca-Cola goes through great lengths to protect the Coca-Cola recipe. Um, and so much so that my understanding is no one person actually knows um, what the recipe is. And, uh, and they do that for a particular reason, because if that recipe got out in the public, out in the marketplace, they would have no recourse. Their strength of the IP is the ability to keep that intellectual property secret. So if it was something that could be reverse engineered or separately discoverable, 
there's, there's not a lot of value in maintaining that as a trade secret if somebody else can figure it out. Um, you can't uh, go after anybody for separately discovering or reverse engineering a trade secret. Um, you can only go after them if they stole your secret, right? And so that's where, um, that's where other forms of, of criminal law come in. And so a good example would be, a, a, and I don't know the whole story, but apparently an employee at Coca-Cola a couple of years ago reached out to Pepsi and said, you know, I have the recipe and was trying to sell Pepsi, the Coca-Cola recipe. And Pepsi immediately called the law department of Coca-Cola saying someone is trying to sell us your trade secret because they knew that that would be an illegal means to obtain the trade secret. Um, so, uh, so there's, and we recently enacted in 2016 the Defend Trade Secrets Act, which adds some additional protections as well to employers when uh, scientists and engineers go from one company to a competitor's company and the type of information that uh, must be retained as trade secret uh, when transferring companies. There was just a very, um, a very large trade secret suit that was in the news for a long time. It was uh, Waymo versus Uber. And um, there the, the allegation was that uh, one of the engineers at Waymo had left and gone to Uber and had taken with him, uh, I think 13,000 um, files that he was alleged to have been used in developing things for Uber. And that case settled, but it was in the news a lot. And um, so that just goes to reinforce the trade secret is not just one thing. It doesn't have to be just one thing. It could be just the, the Coca-Cola formula. But it can also be know-how. It can be um, records. It could be emails. It could be memos. There's a lot of things. Anything where the confidentiality of the, the thing um, helps a business have uh, value, gain commercial value. All right, moving on, we'll talk about copyrights. Uh, copyrights, are the, the broadest definition I can give a copyright is anything that you create and embody onto a medium can be copyright protected. So um, the, I think the, the photos, the artwork around the room are excellent examples. Um, so the, the images are embodied onto uh, the canvas or onto the, the the um, photo boards. Um, so once it is embodied into the medium, you actually automatically have common law rights to that copyright. Um, if you're creating a, a sculpture out of clay, um, there's copyrights uh, that, that you're entitled to once that, um, that artwork has been created. Similarly, if you publish a book or if you have a computer software program, that program, because it's printed, it's not printed, um, the program is saved right into computer memory, which is computer readable medium, so it's still a form of medium, so it's eligible for copyright protection. Um, what the copyright laws in the most part provide is um, an, an, an ability to prevent someone from pirating your product, right? So from copying it, um, from reselling it, um, but what it doesn't provide is an ability to protect what that piece of work was doing, what was the function. So in, in software, for example, um, if I had a software program for a graphical user interface or for a video game, um, it would just be protecting the code and someone stealing that code, right? Uh, it wouldn't be the functions that that code uh, 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 embody when they're executed on a computer and the impact that that software has on the operations of the computer. Those are all covered under inventions. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there's, there's, also no, there's also no copyright protection against independent inventorship, independent authorship. So unlike a patent, which John will talk about in a second, where if you have a patent and somebody else who's never heard of you and never read your patent comes up with an idea and starts doing it, they can still infringe your patent even though they don't know about your patent. With copyright, the right protects you against somebody copying you. It doesn't prevent anybody else from independently coming up with something. So other forms of copyright be music, movies, videos, things like that. Uh, so going back to our Coca-Cola example, um, for Coca-Cola, the copyrights would be like their jingles and their commercial advertisements, um, their print advertisements. And even the label itself, if you took the label off and copied the label, even though there's separate trademark protection for copying the trademark, but you're actually copying a printed work embodied on a medium, there's a copyright violation there as well. Um, so, okay. Moving on, in the interest of time. Um, see, I told you I can spend an hour on this slide. Uh, so we'll talk about design patents next. So we already alluded to this when we were talking about copy, uh, trademarks, where you know, for Coca-Cola, um, the form of the bottle uh, can be protected if that bottle is being used as a, as 
um, as a, a means to distinguish the product, the brand, or the service in the marketplace. But you can also get design patent protection for the ornamental features. Design patents do just that. They protect the form, what something looks like, not the functions that are associated with that product. Um, so, so a good example, again, is the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, easily recognized. Let's take a different bottle as an example and uh, use the Clorox bleach bottle as an example. So the Clorox bleach bottle, you recognize the white bottle with the funky handle. Well, and they, and Coca-Cola could get a design patent for that because it's got that funky handle. But actually it turns out that that handle comes right up to the, the spout, right? And it's got the hollow handle that goes to the back of the bottle. And what that does is allows air to, tran uh, to travel through the handle to prevent the bleach from splashing when you pour it into the, the washing machine. So hey, that's just not form anymore. There's a function associated with this product, right? So because there's a function associated with it, that function leads to invention and the protection of inventions, um, which are utility patents. So kind of, again, talking about the different <coughs> forms of IP and how they may overlap, you could protect that bottle. And there's a group of patent examiners that do, um, that just do utility patents associated with bottles and the functions of those bottles and the spray bottles and all the different types of bottles. Um, and then there's another group of examiners that are design examiners that just look at the form uh, of the, and the shape and, and the ornamental features. So and there's, in this room, there's two flagpoles behind us and the top of each of the flagpoles are purely ornamental, I would argue. And so you would protect them by design patent, not by utility patent. On the other hand, if they had hooks on them and the flags were somehow attached to the, to the things, and primarily they were there for function, you couldn't protect them through design patents. You have to protect them through utility patents. Right. So um, going back to Coca-Cola, since we're, we're taking that thread all the way through these examples. So utility patents for Coca-Cola, there's many. Um, through their bottling systems, uh, the actual, with the plastic bottles actually are these little test tubes that get heated and expanded into a form. That process is patentable. The composition of matter, uh, the, the actual composition of the plastic bottle, Coca-Cola recently acquired a company that 100% uh, of that bottle is made from plant material. Um, so. It, so they've been, um, and so that's a composition of matter. So you can get a patent for a variety of things, the product, the method of making the product, and the compositions of matter, as well as any improvements to those things. Am I missing that? No. <laughs> um, OK, so other examples for Coca-Cola is they have, for example, a hand cart, because they handle their own distributing. So they have this special hand cart for their um, delivery men and delivery women that uh, when uh, they pick up one case of of Coke. The next case rises automatically, so that there's so they don't have to keep bending over, right? So it's so there's so they have things like that that they've been able to um, to innovate to to help improve the process and the delivery of their products. So. Okay, so with that, we'll advance the slide finally. And this is just to show again to to our point uh, that. Intellectual property, uh, there's multiple forms of intellectual property that cover a single product. So here in the example of a typical telephone, uh, you know, you have the trademarks, the brand of the phone, the brand of the software the phone is on, uh, the brand of the apps that are loaded onto that phone. Um, for patents, tons of patents on the actual, the composition of matter for the glass, the, the uh, anti-breaking glass, right? That's, that's there, the semiconductor circuits, chemical compounds, um, battery control that's actually really interesting. So not just the battery itself, but the software that manages that battery so that it extends the life, right? There's function there, so that can be patent protected as well. Um, copyrights is the code, the software code itself, the underlying code, um, the instruction manuals, the printed works, the ringtones, the, the musical aspects of the, the phone itself. And then trade secrets, who knows? Right? <laughs> There's a variety of different trade secrets in there. Um, and actually, that reminds me of one thing. So we can go back one slide real quickly, because I did want to talk about how the different um, I, forms of IP overlap really quickly. Now you know why I spend an hour on one slide. Um, so we talked about how copyrights with you know, computer programs and utility patents relate. 
But with respect to trade secrets, you know, an interesting strategy, and this is a complex strategy, so uh, I think the best way I can explain it is you can actually use patents to also mask a trade secret. So an example would be I might separately be able to get a patent for how to make the color yellow, separately to how to, to get a patent on how to make the color blue, and separately uh, I'll get a patent on how to make the color red. But my trade secret is how I use those things together to get brown, right? And that's a very simple example, but I've seen many companies being able to, to, to mask their trade secret through their patent portfolio. And that's, that's a very complex advanced strategy, but it is possible as well. Um, we talked about another one with copyright and trademarks yesterday. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember it either. Okay, so <laughs> in the interest of time, we'll skip it. Um, <laughs> okay, and then also design patents, um, the shape of the phone, the, the actual uh, shape of the icons on your phone. Uh, so things like that are also eligible for um, design patent protection. Uh, so as you can see, there's about 10,000 patents now that are associated with, with a, a cell phone. So there's a lot of innovation going on uh, in that little device that's in all of our pockets. Okay, next slide. All right, so we've alluded to this a little bit, but it's just to, to stress again how important developing an IP strategy is um, and having intellectual property, how it can bring value to your company and to your business interests. Um, it's attractive to investors. Uh, you know, I had some conversations while I've been here on the island about, um, you know, about investors that have invested in startups that didn't have patent protection versus investors that invested in startups that did have patent protection. And generally, it's about 35 or 40% more funding is generated, uh, is, is obtained by startups with patent protection because that, that, that patent adds value. It's some security that you have the right to make and use, you have the right to exclude others from making and using that invention in, um, in the US, and so it does provide an, an extra strategic advantage, especially when you are looking for funding. Um, it can also increase your leveraging power when you're looking for mergers and acquisitions. Um, and, uh, and if things don't work out, um, having a, a patent um, also provides, it's an asset, so it's something that can be sold, it can be licensed, and when you have the patent, you set the terms on how that patent is being used. Um, and then, you know, lastly, and probably most importantly, it's global. There's a way to, um, to whether it's trademarks or whether it's patents, to, to obtain patent trademark protection, copyright protection globally, and we're going to talk about a couple of those today. Anything? Yes, uh, I would just say that um, probably about half of my clients are startup clients, and it used to be the case that if you didn't have if you didn't have a patent, you weren't going to get any VC funding. That's not as true now because of some of the decisions that the court has, has, um, has issued. Uh, but what's still true is that you have to have an IP strategy. So if you go and you talk to an, uh, to an investor and they say, what's your IP strategy, and you don't have a good answer, then that's a problem. OK, next slide. All right, so trademarks, do you want to? Sure. Take it from you and I'll chime in. So, okay. okay. I, I'm mic'd, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Um, okay. So a trademark, as, as John mentioned earlier, a trademark identifies the source of origins of a good or a service. Uh, so as you see there, it's any word, slogan, symbol, design, or combination that identifies the source of goods and services um, and distinguishes them from someone else. So the idea is, if you think about it from a consumer's perspective, you go into the store, you need, it's, you know, it's tax day, you need some software to help you. Uh, do your taxes, and you're thinking, uh, I want to buy TurboTax. I want to buy TurboTax, and I know that TurboTax, I've seen it before, I know it's, it's distinctive, it's got that white box on it with the red strip that says TurboTax. And you go and you buy what you think is TurboTax, and you get home and you look at it, there's the white box and the red strip, and it says H&R Block. And you think, uh, I was just confused. I accidentally bought the wrong one. And why were you confused? In this hypothetical example, H&R Block, or whoever it was, was trading on the ability to convince you that you were buying a product that came from a different source. And that's what trademark infringement is. That's an example of trademark infringement. Next slide, please. Um, so it, it, right, it can be a design in the example I just gave you. It can be a slogan. It can be a combination of these. It can be a sound, color, or smell. The NBC chime, ding, 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 is trademarked. Um, <laughs> 
forgive my, my tone deafness. <laughs> well done. Thanks. Uh, you can also get, it, it's really anything that you can use to distinguish your product um, from other products in the marketplace. So it's not just limited to words, symbols, um, uh, sounds, smells, um, but also we have one, uh, we have a few patents that are on a texture. Um, for example, there's a, a winery in Napa that the shape of the bottle or the, the bottle has a texture on it that's leather-like. And so that, that texture is what they use to distinguish their product, their bottle from other uh, wine bottles in the marketplace, other wineries. So, um, so there's, uh, how are you distinguishing your brand and the ways that you go about doing that are eligible for um, trademark protection in many respects. If you've, ever, uh, if you've ever walked into a restaurant and you've ordered a Coke, and the server says, is Pepsi OK? It's because of something called policing. I don't know if we have a slide on policing. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. OK. Well, we're going to come to a slide. I'm going to talk about the slide we're coming to on policing. Uh, unlike patents and copyrights, you have to police your trademark rights. If, you, if somebody is using your mark without your authorization, and you don't act to stop them, then you can lose the value of your trademark. And one of the things Coke does, because Coke has one of the most valuable trademarks in the world, is they'll send undercover shoppers, undercover diners into restaurants that, are pe that serve Pepsi. And they'll order, they'll have the people order Coke just to see if the restaurant says, is Pepsi OK? Because if they order Coke and they get Pepsi, that's trademark infringement, right? It's called palming off. And it can devalue the, the Coke brand. And so Coke has to police it. And because the, band is, the brand is so valuable, they spend an amazing amount of resources doing that kind of thing. So types of trademarks. So, um, so different types of trademarks. Again, we're kind of following the Coca-Cola thread today. Um, so you can get a word mark, and that's plain text word mark, just Coca-Cola, right? You can also get a special form mark, which is uh, the word in a certain script or character. And kind of going to the point uh, that Dan made with respect to TurboTax and H and R Block is, say it said, you know, you know. I don't know, wahoo, wahoo, in that text, you might think it's Coca-Cola because you're used to seeing that text. So, so Coca-Cola protects their brand in a variety of different ways. So whether it's a special form mark, the word mark itself, um, the composite mark, which is a combination of words and, uh, and designs, or just a, a pure design mark. And so there's ways uh, to, again, comprehensively think about how to protect your brand. And there is one exception um, that John made me think of when he talked about that Coca-Cola script. You may also have seen it in Budweiser and in John Deere and in some other famous marks. They're t-shirts or hats that are rip-offs. It, it looks like the Coca-Cola thing, but it says something different. And there's a fine line. So if it's parody, there's a First Amendment right to parody. And you, that's not trademark infringement. So those shirts that are allowed to continue um, typically are, are found to be parody in nature, and, and the First Amendment protects them. Anything else is trademark infringement or trademark dilution and not OK. OK, next. All right, so trademarks offer a variety of benefits. This is for federally registered trademarks. I know after uh, this presentation, you're going to hear about the differences between federally registered trademarks and um, common law trademarks and the, tra and the trademarks available through the state of Hawaii. Uh, but, but really, trademarks do bring brand recognition. It puts the public on notice of who the, the, the brand owner is and also gives you the ability to take that mark and record it with the US Customs and Border Protection. And in doing that, that will help prevent infringing products with your brand from entering, in the, in, entering the country. Um, it also serves as a basis of foreign filing. And we're going to talk about the Madrid Protocol briefly towards the end of this presentation. Um, but more importantly, I think in many respects, is we have the, the, the US federally registered trademark database. And that database, the goal of that database, is only to have trademarks that are currently registered by the USPTO and in use in commerce um, in that database. We want that database to be a pure representation of goods currently in use in commerce. And the trademark office will even go out and do random audits to say, please demonstrate that your product is still being used in commerce, and you would have to provide a use specimen or cancel the mark generally. So, so we want that to be um, so that when you're searching to figure out when you come up with you know, your great brand name and you want to go to the trademark register to see if it's, been, uh, in, if it's been registered already, we want to be able to show you, well, these are the marks that are currently registered and therefore in force in the US. 
Um, if you, you've probably read or heard about all the efforts being done to stop imports from offshore. Um, you've probably seen fake Chanel bags, Louis Vuitton, um, Omega watches. Those are all seizable because they're counterfeit goods. They violate trademark rights. And of course, the best part is you get to use the R, the circle with the R in it, right? So. <laughs> OK, next slide. Um, so how do you stop somebody from infringing your mark? Or how do you know if somebody's infringing your mark? And the question is, would the consumer be confused? So the example I gave before about you buy a tax product thinking it's coming from one source, and it turns out it's coming from a different source, you were confused. And so that likelihood of confusion is what establishes infringement. So it's, as it says here, do the, do the products look alike? Do they sound alike? Um, do they have similar meetings? Do they, um, do they create similar impressions in, in, in the business space? Um, and are they, are they related? Uh, so, so your tax software example is perfect because it was yeah. both in, um, in, in, in tax filing software. Whereas uh, Century 21, I think, is another good example where it's obviously, and many of you will think of it immediately as a realtor, right, around the country. But there's also a, a series of clothing stores uh, that are called Century 21 as well. And because it's not in the same, the goods are, and services are not related, it does not pose a, a trademark infringement per se. Also, one that I took in law school, everybody in law school, they look things up on either Westlaw or LexisNexis. But when you go to the um, car dealer and you buy a Lexus, it's the same sounding word. And there was, I believe there was litigation on it. So, <laughs> that's the example. Exactly. Oh, there so, you go. OK. Uh, yeah, for the confusion, because they sound the same, even yeah. though they're spelled differently. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. So it turned out it was OK. There was no infringement on the Lexus Lexus. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the strength of the mark. And so that's the, there are different types of marks, not just between words, symbols, combination marks. Um, and design marks. Um, but if you go to the next slide. I just learned a new word, registrability. Registrability. And there's patentability as well. So, <laughs> um, OK. So uh, <laughs> trademarks have different strengths depending on, and by strengths we mean how protectable they are, how enforceable your rights are, depending on where they fit on this spectrum. Uh, and we'll give some examples of each, but the, the most protectable mark is one that's arbitrary or fanciful. Um, and then suggestive is less, descriptive is less, and then the weakest is generic. And so do we have a slide on examples, or should yes, I give some? Yes, we do. OK. OK, so we're starting at the bottom. So generic terms are basically where the mark itself describes the category of things. So the example here is bicycle, which let's say that you have a store that sells bicycles, and you call it bicycle. You probably have no trademark rights there. It's a generic term. It describes the whole category itself. If you had a, if you had a web browser and you called it web browser, same thing. Descriptive is, as you, as you can see, uh, the name itself is not, doesn't describe the category, but it, the word tells you what the things do. So creamy for yogurt, the ultimate bike rack for a bike rack. Um, so it's more than just the generic word, right? It's not bike rack. It's the ultimate bike rack. But it's descriptive. It describes what it is. If it was, you know, if you walked into a restaurant call or you passed a car, a street cart on the street, and it was called the hot dog stand, what would you think that it sells, right? It's descriptive. Um, suggestive, right, is it doesn't exactly describe it, but it suggests to you what the goods and services are. So the examples we have are uh, quick and neat for pie crust, glance a day for calendars. OK. Um, I'm not sure I can think of another one off the top of my head that fast. But. Well, there's one that I like to use for Mexican food. Mm. And so like generic would be you know, burritos for burritos, right? Or, or um, descriptive would be the, the burritos, the burrito place, or Molly's burritos. Um, suggestive would be something like Chipotle. Right, which has it's a pepper that's used in Mexican food, but it's not, you know, it's it's not um, you know directly tied to Mexican food. So, but it does suggest uh, and makes that that correlation. And then going on, then we'll we'll give some more examples on that thread. I just thought of some suggestive marks: Pago, Stop and Stop and Shop, those kinds of things. They're suggestive. They don't tell you. Yeah. They don't exactly tell you it's a store, but they give you the idea. So that's suggestive. 
OK, fanciful and arbitrary, these are the strongest level of protection because the mark itself is unrelated to the thing that, that is being identified. So um, in the olden days, we would have said Xerox. But Xerox, Xerox is a story of what can happen if you, <laughs> if you don't police your mark. Um, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, Google. Google, sort of. You might argue Google is suggestive, um, but maybe not. Um, Esso, uh, Exxon. Exxon, Exxon was actually, so when, when Esso, which is what Exxon's called everywhere else in the world, like in Canada where I'm from, Esso was, I think, confusingly similar at one point to Standard Oil, S-O, Standard Oil. And so um, the company came up with a fanciful mark that had no meaning so that it could have strong trademark protection. And the one they came up with was Exxon, right? E-X-X-O-N, has no relationship to, to oil. And then the, going to the next slide, the difference between fanciful and arbitrary are arbitrary are words that you recognize today, but they're used in, in, in commerce in a completely different way. So Apple, it's not for selling apples. It's for selling computer equipment. You know, Gap for clothing. Um, Blackberry, even Alphabet now, the, the spinoff of Google as well. Uh, so, and the fanciful and arbitrary marks, and we'll show you a slide shortly, um, are the most valuable marks in, in the, even globally because uh, they're the ones that have the strongest type of protection. Oh, so going back to my Mexican food example, so fanciful and arbitrary um, would be uh, like Codoba, if you're familiar with that chain, it's QDBOA or something like that, um, which is, doesn't mean a thing, but its um, brand is, is now uh, affiliated with Mexican food. So when you see the Codoba logo, you think, oh, there's Mexican food there. Uh, but it, the, the, the word was totally uh, created. Somebody thought it meant something in uh, Mexico or was a place in, in, uh, in uh, Central America, but it's none of the above. What do you think about our two uh, featured entrepreneurs, um, the Maui cookie lady? That's very descriptive, right? You, I don't think you can get more descriptive than that. And then. Rappoli, I think that's also a clever name. Where would they fit in your spectrum here? So I'm not a trademark examining attorney, but I, I mean, I think Rappoli definitely falls in the, um, in probably the arbitrary, um, yeah, fanciful, or fanciful, fanciful probably, probably fanciful. fanciful. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, the, um, the Maui cookie lady probably in descriptive or suggestive. I'd probably go suggestive. Suggestive, yeah. perhaps, yeah. Oh, we skipped Dutch on our side, right? Oh, yeah. So, so the other thing, uh, yeah, it's important to police your marks, just like Dan was saying, with respect to Coca-Cola going in and, and having secret shoppers ask for Coke at Pepsi establishments. Um, similarly, uh, companies go through great lengths to police their marks so they don't become generic. And if you're generic, you lose your trademark. And so it happened to Zipper, it happened to Escalator, um, and the yo-yo as well. And the next uh, slide shows some marks that are at risk of losing their trademark. Uh, and, um, but but uh, at risk, but have not lost their trademark because these companies go through great length to protect that mark. So, you know, you know Kleenex, you know, if you ask for a Kleenex, you should, it, you, it better be a Kleenex brand tissue. Right, so they want you to use a Kleenex brand tissue, not a Kleenex. Um, and Xerox wants you to make a photocopy on a Xerox photocopier. Similarly, Google, um, they want you to Google it, <laughs> but they only want you to Google it on a Google search engine. Right, so, so they have to go through these great lengths to police and protect their mark, otherwise they, they uh, face a risk of losing their mark. So the, the loss happens if the, if the mark itself stops identifying the source, right, and starts identifying the category. So, and this is happening. Velcro it, is at risk. Is Velcro is at risk. There's actually, you should go on YouTube and search for the Velcro trademark video. It's one of the funniest videos the ever. Hook and loop fasteners. Yes, right? the hook so and loop fasteners. Hook, it's yeah, the Velcro, Velcro IP team put out this video. <laughs> it's just hilarious, asking you to please stop calling everything Velcro. But it's really funny and really well done. <laughs> OK, next slide. Okay. Um, let me, go ahead. Okay. So just um, to recap on the, the trademark basics, uh, remember trademarks are, are there to protect your brand and to define your brand. The federal registration provides nationwide protection, and again, you'll hear about the distinction between that and other types of trademarks uh, in the country. Um, and if the stronger the mark, the more easily it is to enforce, and that's um, that's a critical 
an important factor for any company. Um, we always recommend, whether it's trademarks or patents, that you secure the services of, a, uh, of an attorney to, to help with, with trademark matters and of a registered patent practitioner for assistance with patent matters. Uh, and just to remember, your, your, you and your trademark are the face of your business. So, so really, um, the, the efforts that you put in defining and building your brand help to build the value of that brand. And then next. Yeah, all right, so this was the, the slide I was sharing. So this one I think is from 2016, which shows the most valuable trademarks in the world. And, um, and you can see all of them are either fanciful or arbitrary. And, and because they are more, um, you're able to enforce those marks, and because they are fanciful and arbitrary, they, they, they kind of stick with the consumer in the association of that product to, uh, to, it, to its brand and to its respective brand and, and also in distinguishing that product from its competitors in the marketplace. Okay, um, I promise we talk a little bit about trademark, international trademark filing. Um, on, uh, on the patent side of the house, we have something called Patent Cooperation Treaty and hopefully we'll get some time to talk about that, but I don't know how much time we have. Um, but uh, for trademarks, the interesting thing about trademarks is whether you have a trademark uh, already filed and registered, say you already have a trademark registered, you can still pursue Madrid protocol um, protection of that trade, registration of that trademark in up to 96 countries around the world. Um, and if you, at time of filing, um, also within six months of filing your trademark, request uh, a, a Madrid protocol filing, then the date that you file uh, in, in the US or, or in whichever country you first file your trademark, if you file the Madrid protocol within six months of that, that Madrid filing will be treated as if it was filed six months earlier. So it's a good way to establish priority in multiple countries um, around the world. And then there's a, an IB, it's called the International Bureau, that, um, that serves as kind of, uh, of the centralizing authority for international trademark registrations through the Madrid protocol process. It's a little bit more info on the next slide. Yeah, so um, yeah, to base an international application on one or more USPTO applications or registrations, as I mentioned, so the following must be true. Um, so the owner, of, the owners have to be the same um, between the the original filing and the the Madrid protocol filing. Um, the mark must be identical and in the same good or service. And as well. So it has to not only be the same mark, but identified in the same good or service. And we didn't really talk too much about that, but trademarks are registered in a respective good or service. So there's a different, there's an international classification of uh, trademark registration. So when you file a trademark, you not only identify, well, this is my trademark, you also have to identify it's for this good or service. So whether it's for um, computer software, it'd be like class 43, or if it's apparel, it has its own class. Um, if it's a food product, if it's an automotive uh, vehicle or anything along those lines, they have different classes of good or service. So, so big brands that cover many goods or services have many trademarks covering all these different classes of goods or services. Like you know, Coca-Cola is a good example because they not just manufacture beverages, but you know, they have bikes with their logo and T-shirts and things like that. So they have, um, uh, you know, they request uh, trademark registration in a variety of different classes of goods and services. So those must be the same uh, when you file internationally as well. And the next slide. Um, so this is some advantages of the Madrid protocol. The nice thing is it's just one office for filing um, instead of the 96 offices where you would have to file separately. Um, it, it can, it, it's a, a, a common language, so it's, everything's in English uh, or, or whichever uh, language it is filed from. Um, one currency, so it, it's, everything has been unified with respect to the Madrid Protocol to make it as easy on trademark owners as possible uh, to obtain international registration. Um, and there's one renewal, so instead, we didn't really talk about term, um, but trademarks are renewed after the first six years that you obtain a, a, a US trademark, and then at the 10 year mark, and then every 10 years after that. So trademarks are great because they stay in force as long as you're using that mark in that good or service uh, in the marketplace. So, uh, so there's a way to really extend your IP by using trademarks. Patents expire after 20 years from the earliest filing. Um, copyrights expire you know, depending on the type of copyright between 75 and 90 years. So, um, so trademarks are the only one 
that really, really can last um, indefinitely, with the exception, I would say, of trade secrets, if you're able to keep the trade secret secret for um, indefinitely as well. Um, so lots of advantages to taking advantage of the Madrid Protocol filing. Um, okay, next slide, I think is. So this just to show you um, all of the different uh, countries that you can currently, through one filing, obtain multiple filings around the world. Um, all of the ones in bold uh, fall under the European Union, which is in red there. Um, so again, just even if you just filed a Madrid Protocol filing with the EU, you're getting even uh, expanded protection um, through, that, uh, through that single filing. And you can also designate um, multiple countries, all the countries that you would like to designate. But again, um, you, you have to also specify your product in use, in commerce, in those countries as well. So much like you can't get a uh, federally registered trademark in the US until you demonstrate to us that that product is being in used in commerce in the US. Um, so uh, so you, you can file these in other countries with an intent to use, but the, tr the mark won't be registered until uh, the, product, the, uh, the mark is actually in use in commerce. Okay. That's it for trademarks. <laughs> are we on time? Are, how are we on time? Oh, perfect, okay. Um, so we'll go through patents pretty quickly. Um, so patents are unique and differ from trademarks in one primary way. Um, trademarks, you have to demonstrate that you're actually using um, the mark in commerce in order to get the trademark. Patents, once you have the patent, it doesn't give you the right to use the patent. It gives you the right to exclude others from the making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing of your patented invention. It's a really interesting distinction. Um, and I don't have my coffee cup with me today, but, um, but, so, but everyone can visualize this, right? So let's say, for example, Dan is a patent owner on those little cardboard sleeves that you get to protect your hand from, um, from burning from a hot cup of coffee, right? So those little corrugated cardboard sleeves. So Dan may have a patent on that. And I may, fig I may see his patent and say, hey, that's a really cool invention, but you know, wouldn't it be greater if it had a little handle on it as well? So I might be able to get a patent for his cardboard sleeve adding in the fact that the cardboard sleeve has a handle, and as long as the examiner says that that's new and novel and not obvious, although it probably would get an obvious type of rejection um, in reality, but let's say I get the patent for this additional element of having this corrugated coffee sleeve with a handle, now, Dan has the patent on, and so he excludes me from being able to manufacture his corrugated sleeve. I exclude him from being able to manufacture his corrugated sleeve with my handle. And um, so because of that, if we each wanted to make each other's products, we would have to form a licensing agreement and come to terms, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to patents, once you have a patent, you set the terms on how that patent is used. Um, so, so hopefully that, that's a simple example of how the ex right of exclusion works. Anything you want to add? Yeah, just that's one of, one of my big pet peeves is when people ex talk about the patent monopoly because a monopoly makes it sound like a positive right. It makes it sound like you have the right to do something. But a patent right is actually a negative right, as John just explained. It's the right to stop other people from doing something. It doesn't give you the right to affirmatively do anything yourself. Right. Um, and then to obtain patent protection, uh, you have to get patent protection in every country um, where you want that, where you want to enforce the rights of that invention. Um, so in the U.S., if you get a patent in the U.S., it's only enforceable in the U.S. Um, but the difference is you don't have to necessarily be manufacturing, like in, in trademarks, or you have to have the product in use in that country. You can file in any country in the world. Um, and it really just, per, that right, get in, if you get patent rights in other countries, that gives you the ability to exclude others from making, using, selling your invention in that country. It doesn't mean you have to. There, there are certain countries like India where um, if you don't do the thing that you have a patent on, which is called working the patent, if you don't work the patent in some countries, like India, for example, um, you can be forced to license your product, your patent, to others who want to work it. That's not true in the US, but it is true in some of the countries, right. which just reinforces the point. Every country has its own independent set of patent laws. They're harmonized in many ways, particularly in terms of how you get the patent. But once you have the patent, the enforcement of your patent rights are very different in different countries. Thank you. Next slide. 
Um, so the, the benefit of the patent system, it's a, we call it a quid pro quo. So we give you a limited monopoly, per se, of uh, up to 20 years from the date of filing of your patent application. Uh, so the, the, up to that 20 years, you have the right to exclude others from the making, using, selling, offering for sale, and importation of your invention. Um, in return for that, you have to tell us in writing, in your patent application, how to make and use uh, your invention. So there's a disclosure requirement. And we have that disclosure requirement for a particular reason. And it's one of the things that, um, that have really helped to advance technology in this country and in other countries with similar IP systems. Because having, being able to put out on notice this is what I have patent protection for. This is how to make and use that invention. I have the right to exclude you from making using that invention. So you, as another party, have a couple options. You could steal my invention, at which point I will sue you. Um, you can uh, innovate around my invention, right? Come up with a new way or a different way of doing it, uh, of doing that invention. Or um, you can seek a licensing agreement with me to use my invention in, uh, and we would set terms that are agreeable to both parties. So, so that's one of the things that has really helped to spur that innovation of around the patent system. Um, not only th through licensing has it helped to strengthen the economy, through the, 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 um, the uh, lack of words today. The incentive, thank you, uh, so <laughs> through the incentive to innovate around patented products uh, has helped to advance technology in an exponential way. And we've seen that through our patent filings. We now get over 600,000 patents a year um, filed just within the US. About half of those are coming from within the US alone. Um, and the other half are filed from other countries around the world. OK, so in 2013, the US system converted to a first inventor to file system. So this is really important because you want to file before you publicly disclose your invention. And we have a slide to talk about public disclosure in a second and what that means. But um, if you only want US protection, yes, you can disclose your invention uh, and within one year, as long as you file your application within one year, you can still be entitled to patent protection for that disclosed invention, um, as long as it was found to be new and useful and patent eligible and, and the invention clearly described, um, that, that would, you would be entitled to a patent for that. But, um, but the bigger uh, issue is now, you know, especially if you, if you publicly disclose your invention prior to filing, there are several countries around the world that are absolute novelty countries, which means any disclosure, public disclosure prior to filing can be used against you um, in, the, in the seeking of patent protection in that country. And that that's literally applies to all of Europe uh, under the, the, Europe, the EU and uh, Japan. And some countries have a 12-month grace period like we do. If we disclose, we still have a year to file. Some have a six-month, some have a nine-month. So you really have to know, um, you know where you want to seek patent protection. And if you only want it in the US, you, you still run a risk at, at disclosing your invention uh, prior to filing because somebody else might be able to disclose, uh, to, to file an application very similar to what you're doing in between your public disclosure and um, and when you actually file. So the best protection is we're a first to file system. So file first and then disclose is the best protection you can get. Next slide. So as far as types of disclosure, um, so there's a, so the disclosure requirement is, uh, so the disclosure requirement in the application is the application must be written in such clear and concise terms to enable somebody skilled in that technology, of ordinary skill in that technology, to be able to read your, your description of your invention and make and use the invention, right? So, so it's a full disclosure. You have to tell us how you make it so that we understand the scope of the patent protection that you are seeking. Um, so what you can say before filing is let's say my invention is I invent a 3D printer that is 50% faster than its predecessor. If I tell you I have a 3D printer that's 50% faster, do you know how I made, made it 50% faster? No, I haven't given you enough details to trip that disclosure, um, public disclosure clock, that, that start of that one year period. 
But, uh, but if I told you that I ran servo mechanisms in parallel and boosted the feed speed and the power supply and gave you all these details of how I made my printer faster, well, then I probably said too much that someone skilled in that, in that field can, from that disclosure, say, hey, if I boost the speed feed, the feed speed, that'd be great. Um, so, and, and so I've, I've said too much, and I've started that disclosure clock. The, the issue is, um, and many times, you know, especially emerging enterprises love to use crowdfunding campaigns, you know, like the Indiegogo and Kickstarter and the variety of them out there. Um, and the one thing that is, is interesting about these campaigns, while I think it's a great mechanism to generate revenue for a new company, at the same time, you're putting yourself at great risk if you don't have a patent filed first, um, primarily because Right now, I, it, the way that these campaigns work is I, I start a campaign, I say, you give me $200 today, and in six months, I'll give you my 3D printer that is 50% faster. Um, have I told you how to make and use my invention? No, but I've essentially offered it for sale. And because I've offered it for sale, I've essentially telling you I have reduced it to practice. And because of that, it triggers an on sale bar, not a disclosure bar. And because I'm offering it for sale, I don't need to tell you how to make and use the invention because I'm already saying that I've reduced it to practice. So crowdfunding campaigns, we think, fall into that category. There have been no decisions, no court cases to date. Um, and you don't want to be the test case that goes out there when you could have easily filed a provisional application for $65 or $130 and locked in a filing date before you started any type of those campaigns. So especially when any, any form of public disclosure, but those are, I think, incredibly additionally risky just because it's uncharted territory. Is it an offer for sale? Is it just generating revenue for manufacturing? And those decisions have not been made, but most people seem to agree it's an offer for sale. Okay, and um, the, the can't I just keep it secret, I like that because we talked about trade secrets already, and if it's something that you can, can keep secret and still um, you know, manufacture your invention and, and generate revenue, that's great. Um, the flip side is, well, what if I just publicly disclose it? And I'm already, I'll just put it out there in a publication and tell you how to make and use it, right? So does that prevent somebody from getting a patent for that disclosure? And the answer is, yeah, it probably does, but it doesn't protect the scope of patent protection that you can get um, through the claims of your application, which are defined you know, to give you some breadth and to make it harder for someone to innovate around your disclosure. And any change that anyone makes from a disclosure that's just out there in public um, you know, could be filed for a patent on, the, on those changes. So, um, so you do put yourself at risk by even just putting it out there in disclosure. Usually what, what happens is companies, they, um, they, they go through great lengths, especially larger companies, to identify what are the disclosures, what are some of the things the engineers are working on, how do you rank those, like what's going to be of the most strategic value for the company, what's those that we're not too sure but maybe we'll file a patent on in any way, and the other ones are which ones do we just put in the public domain so it's just out there. And so that's what the, the, the companies with, um, you know, th that have large patent portfolios, they put the inventions they don't care about into the public domain to prevent somebody from from um, getting a patent on it per se, but at the same time, they, uh, uh, they've already put it out there because they don't have strategic value in it or it's not within their mission. So the, um, the disclosure, in order, to, in order to either start your 12-month clock in the US and Canada and Australia, or to eliminate your rights in those other countries that don't offer a grace period, in order for you to meet that threshold, as John said, the disclosure has to be enabling. It has to be sufficiently detailed so that the person hearing it could make and use it. But it also has to be public. And what that means is if you're a startup and you're looking for funding or you're looking to see the feasibility of doing something, if you talk to somebody under an NDA, under a non-disclosure agreement, you haven't jeopardized your rights. You haven't started your US clock. And you haven't jeopardized your rights in Europe and China and Japan that don't have a grace period. So the important thing to do is keep yourself under an NDA. Um, if the other party violates the NDA, you can sue them, but you still lose your patent rights. So just because you have an NDA doesn't, if, if it's an unsavory person on the other side of the deal, you can't trust them. And also VCs typically will never sign an NDA. Yeah. So the best course of action is still file your application before you start talking. But if you can't do that, make sure you talk only under NDA. So I was told we have two minutes. So can um, I just add, we need to just, when you have an acronym like that, NDA, let's yeah. make sure we tell everybody. Non-disclosure agreement. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so we only have two minutes, and we have a few more slides left. Uh, so I just wanted to, to highlight for patents, um, I mentioned before it's 20 years from the date of filing of your patent application. We call the utility applications non-provisional applications. You have 20 years from the date of filing um, uh, till the patent expires. Uh, but you can extend that by a year by the filing of a provisional application. The provisional application comes in handy for a variety of different reasons. And many companies choose uh, to take advantage of a provisional application. Many do not. It really just depends on the strategic value of, uh, or if you're just about to go to a trade show and you don't have time to, to file the full uh, patent application, you can file a provisional. Um, if you want to make sure that you're extending your maximum term, having a provisional application gives you an ability to, to get an extra year in of that term. One thing to keep in mind is that description that I mentioned, the disclosure that must be disclosed in such a way to enable someone skilled in the art to make and use the invention. That disclosure requirement, the statute that governs that, is exactly the same for both applications. So it's important to make sure that even though this is a much more simplified filing, the provisional application, it only lasts a year. You must file this application before that one year expires, and then you claim the benefit to the prior filing, and that gives you, it will be treated, everything that's filed in this application that existed in the provisional application will be treated as if this information was filed a year earlier. So it's a good way to kind of lock in a, a, um, a filing date. Um, the next slide talks just really quickly about the, there's only four things that you need. Actually, go one more slide just in the interest of time. Yes, only four things that you need. You need that description. Um, there's drawings if they're needed to understand the description as well as the filing fee. So the filing fee for under-resourced small inventors um, making less than three times the national average salary, which is somewhere around 150,000, you're eligible for micro-entity status, so a provisional application, which is 75% off of all of our fees. So a provisional will be $65. If you don't qualify for that, it's $130. And it's a good way to just kind of lock in quickly um, some patent protection, but you need to still take the specification must be clearly described and still uh, in compliance with our statutes. And then there's a cover sheet. So there's only those four things, so it's a good way to just get a filing date. And now you can put patent pending, you can join crowdfunding campaigns if you want to, you can go to a trade show or whatever um, makes sense, sense for you. Let's go to the next slide. Just. Okay, just, and we're gonna just tick through resources really quickly. Um, this is the IP awareness assessment tool. So this, if you're still not sure what type of IP um, might best fit your own needs, um, this is a questionnaire. It takes about 30 or 40 minutes to complete, takes some time, but at the end, it'll say, oh, well, based on your responses, it sounds like you might need a design patent or possibly a trademark. And it gives you resources on where to go uh, for the next steps. Next slide. And they can get to this at that. URL yes, yeah. You can always go to USPTO.gov and, and type in IP assessment as well, and it'll just pop up. Um, so next slide. Um, the regional offices. I uh, don't know what happened there. Okay. Um, regional offices, again, uh, Silicon Valley office covers the seven western states. You're going to get three maps in a row. The next one. Let's just click again. Our, our patent and trademark resource center, so there is one here on the island in um, on Oahu uh, that's in the state library downtown uh, that has public workstations where you can use the same search system that our patent examiners use and also has an exp expanded list of periodicals that relate to uh, startups and patenting and trademarks and all the forms of IP. Um, the next slide talks about the patent pro bono program. So this is a way to get free legal advice and assistance with your patent filings, uh, particularly for under-resourced inventors. Uh, the state of Hawaii is covered by the California Lawyers for the Arts. So you can go to the California Lawyers for the Arts website and you can apply through that site. Um, there's also on the USPTO's pro bono page. Again, if you just go to USPTO.gov and type in pro bono, um, there's a, a really great video that covers different forms of IP as well. The, the last map to share with you is our law school clinic programs. Uh, we currently 
do not have a clinic in Hawaii, but there are clinics all around the country and they're not state governed. And this is where students that are gonna become patent attorneys or trademark attorneys uh, get experience with assisting under-resourced inventors uh, and innovators on filing their trademarks and uh, filing their patents. So uh, some of them are patents and trademark centers. One is patent, some are patents only, some are trademarks only. Um, but you know, if you need to take advantage of these resources, there are a variety of them available around the country. And lastly, um, this, oh, actually, oh, perfect. So instead of taking a picture of this slide, um, we left these out front. Can you, let me put this away real quick. Okay. Um, we left these out front, which are, okay, um, the covers of these four periodicals that we, that we publish on the basic types of patents, trademarks, um, the difference between design and utility patents, and on the back, are the links to those publications online, as well as all the resources and more that you see uh, up on the screen. So please take advantage of those. And um, there's just some other materials out front as well, which is the patent prosecution highway. We talked about um, the Madrid protocol on patents, we, uh, trademarks, excuse me. We did not get a chance to talk about the patent cooperation treaty, um, but there's also uh, the patent prosecution highway, which is a way to get free expedited examination for applications that you have in multiple countries. Um, and then there's also out there a pamphlet on our intellectual property attaches that are stationed in US embassies around the world. So if you do run into issues with respect to enforcing your intellectual property in um, countries around the world, we have 13 of them that pretty much blanket the, the globe. And, uh, and all of their their uh, names are available on the website. You can reach out to them directly. They are specifically located in embassies where IP enforcement in that region is a challenge for U.S. industries, and they're, help, they're there to help you navigate that process and can also help facilitate intro introductions with um, leaders in those countries uh, and, and other resources in those countries to help you with your enforcement of your rights. Thank you. I think it's the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, while I'm queuing up the next speaker, can I ask you um, a couple questions that came in online? Sure. Um, one question from Maui. Is there such a thing as a provisional patent? Yeah, so I went through it really quickly. The provisional application was that application that I mentioned that only lasts one year. Um, it's $130 if you're a small business, small entity, and you get another uh, reduction to $65 if you qualify as a micro entity. That's where you just provide us with your, your clearly written disclosure of your invention. Um, along with any drawings, you have the filing fee and the cover sheet, and that gives you patent pending status um, for up to one year, but by the end of that year, you would need to file the non-provisional or utility patent application. Thank you. Did I spell it wrong? Well, somewhere I have a first grade teacher rolling in her grave. <laughs> Great. Thank you very okay. much. That's it. Thank you very much. Again, there'll be plenty of time to ask questions to the panelists when we're finished here. Our next speaker uh, brings things here much more locally. Um, it's Jaina Uehara. She's the manager of the Business Action Center here. Your office is right over here off of, yeah, in Nimitz. Um, I've been there a couple times. It's great. Um, in fact, I've used the online chat before to talk to people there. Does that, yeah, it's great. Uh, I got a lot of questions answered. Um, so Jane is going to talk a, a little bit about um, what is available here locally in terms of uh, resources, especially uh, what the state can provide uh, with a bit of an emphasis on trademarking. So please welcome Jane Uehara. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm with a, an office called the Business Action Center. And um, again, we're located right down here on Nimitz Highway where Eagle Cafe is located, we're right upstairs. Um, I have three people on staff there and we're basically a walk-in counter for um, self-help, um, pe people who wanna do self-help with their businesses and kind of do their own filings. 
Um, one thing I should mention, you know, we've been talking a lot about the federal registrations and what you can do on the federal level, but I kind of wanted to back up a little bit and talk about what we do at, at our office and at Business Registration Division, which the Business Action Center is a part of. So the Business Registration Division is one of um, about a dozen um, divisions within the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. So basically, if you wanted to start an entity or form an entity like an LLC, corporation, partnership, register a trade name, you would come to our office. Um, and it is a matter, these types of registrations are a matter of state law. So every state has its own business registration filings. So if you wanted to start a Hawaii LLC, you would come to us over at State of Hawaii um, Bragg. Or if you wanted to start a California partnership, you'd have to go to California. And um, there would be different laws that would be governing your entity. Um, so the state registries are kind of siloed. They're, um, in our state registry, we might have names um, of businesses that are, you know, are only compared against whatever is in our registry, whatever is registered in our registry. So if Sarah you know, registered rapidly, um, in Hawaii, as an LLC, I'm not sure how you're how you're organized, but if she if she had that on record in Hawaii and somebody tried to register a substantially identical name, that's the standard that we use in order to reject the name. We would um, so so say for example, someone tried to register rapidly Hawaii. That just adding Hawaii at the end of the name doesn't make it different enough for us, for business registration division to approve. So that name would be rejected. Um, again, that that sometimes doesn't please everybody. They, you know, if you know somebody came up with another word behind rapidly or um, in front of it, you know, um, we we might have to go ahead and ha uh, go ahead and approve it unless it's something like a coined word. Um, but there are different um, uh, rejection processes that happen when you do submit um, an entity or trade name registration. One of the one of the other registrations that we have are um, the the trade um, uh, the trademarks and service mark registrations. So we do have that in Hawaii, but again, it's only compared against whatever is already registered in Hawaii. Um, so I think. What we've learned today from listening to Dan and John is that you do have to sort of, before kind of jumping in and doing a state registration, you should have a more um, robust IP strategy before you even start the, the state registration. Obviously, our state registration is um, not as complicated. Um, so I'll give you a, for instance, we don't do colors, we don't do scents, and we don't do, um, we don't do sound. So there would be no way that our registry could capture that information. Um, so I wanted to show you this, um, this website. This is our business registration division website. On the right-hand side here where it says Bregg Spotlight, you're going to be able to access all of the information that I think is the most, inf um, most um, uh, important for you to know as business owners. So if you did want to, the business name search, the very first button up there, or the, the first bullet, that would allow you to do keyword searches as to what kind of names have already been registered, um, and also um, marks, marks, um, trademarks and service marks. Okay, so y there's, a, there's a keyword search engine that would pop up if you, if you hit that link. Um, the other thing that you, that you can view on that site is whether your business is in good standing with, um, with the state of Hawaii. And that would only pertain to businesses that are business entities like corporations, partnerships, or LLCs. Okay, um, if you do find that you are delinquent with an annual filing, please call our office. It's not that hard to get back into good standing. And um, we really encourage people, we've had you know, several people, or we've had a case in the past where someone had actually falsified um, a good standing document, and that's you know it's that's um, it can be a, like a class C felony, would be the um, one of the um, penalties. So it's very simple um, to to get back into good standing for like 95, 97 percent of the time that a business is not in good standing is because they haven't done their annual business filing, which is that fifth bullet down. 
Not that hard, right, though, to get back into good standing. Right. So the business annual report filing link would take you to the annual report filing site. And right now we've changed the, um, they've updated the website where you can actually do multiple um, delinquent back filings. Before, we, you could only do the, the current year's filing online, but um, it, the, with the new modification, it's made it so much easier for people to get back into good standing. So please don't be afraid of you know, how much it's going to cost. It's not that much. Um, but if you have any questions, um, you can give us a call and we'll uh, gladly help you out with that. Um, okay, so actually, if you, why don't we go to the, the last um, link there, the registration forms and fees and information on the bottom. I'm going to show you how to access the, the um, forms pertaining specifically to trade names and trademarks. So you'll notice down the, down the center of the page, we've got all of the forms um, sort of separated by entity type. So we've got domestic, um, nonprofit, and then foreign profit and foreign nonprofit. But if you scroll all the way to the very end on the bottom there, you'll see a link um, for trade name, trademark, or service mark. And if you click on info and forms, It'll take you to a, um, like an explanation of our, of our trade name and trademark service mark registrations. And Rob, if you can click on the link that says complete listing of all PDF, fillable PDF forms on the, that third bullet on the top, on the left-hand side. Yeah. So there's other ways to get here on eHawaii, but I like to use this one just because I know you can see all of the, all of the forms that pertain to um, trademark filings. So you'll notice um, the T1 is for registration of trade names, which is a fictitious company name. Um, trademarks and service marks have different forms in Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure um, Ra, um, if John and Dan, if, if there's a separate form between service marks and trademarks on the federal level, but on the, on the state level, um, we do have different um, different forms. One of the uh, the differences between the trademark and the service mark forms is each form, when you register a, a mark, um, there's a specimen that's required that you submit to prove that to prove usage. So they talked about you know before about how you have to prove that you've, you're actually using the mark in commerce. Um, so that's how DCCA determines that you're actually using the mark, is that you have to submit a specimen. And there are different specimen requirements regarding, you know, pertaining to um, a trademark versus a service mark. So for trademarks, those are for manufactured goods. So if you are manufacturing a good, you would be um, registering a mark. If um, the, what some of the, the acceptable specimens would be tags, like hang tags that you have on your product, or you could submit um, the packaging with your mark um, printed on it. Um, we've had people send their cookie jars with you know, their product in it, but you know, as, as much as possible, um, we like it to be something flat. <laughs> um, but, but whatever you have, you know, we, can, um, we can accept, and they'll Business Registration Division will work with you on that. Um, and if you do have any questions, again, you should just call and just confirm if that's something that's going to work. Uh, a lot of people kind of just do it on the fly, and they just want to get it done in 15 minutes or something and fill out their form um, without really thinking, putting too much thought into it. But again, you know, you can. there's a lot of resources and a lot of people that you can ask for help. So take advantage of those resources. Um, the, t the last two documents on that list was also something I wanted to po point out because um, we do track the federal classification system. We do use the same numbers. And so those would be the list of the classification numbers that you can peruse. Um, and again, there's different classification uh, numbers for trademark versus service mark. And you'll, and if you, uh, Rob, can you click one of those open? so they can see. It's going to be a PDF file. I don't know if you can open up the PDF file. Uh, it will open, but it will, oh, okay. it'll cause a... Okay, never mind. But it's, it's basically just a list of all of the classes and a, a description of what's contained in each class. 
And just like the federal registrations, we, we do, um, our registrations are one class per registration. Um, our trade name, um, our trademark registrations are good for five years. They cost $51 for normal processing. Um, one of the other things that I should tell you is that we do compare trademarks against trade name registrations. So that's probably something that doesn't happen on the federal level. But we, um, whatever's in our registry that's registered as a name or, an en or even an entity name will compare against marks with um, the similar words, okay? So you can get rejected if you've, if, for your mark if um, it contains words that are substantially identical to an entity or a trade name. So just keep that in mind. So it's good to use that business name search just to see what's on record in Hawaii before you, um, you actually go ahead and submit your documentation. So these are the service marks um, classifications. Are there marks that you see the largest percentage of X? Yeah, in Hawaii, probably the, the most popular ones are class 25 clothing and maybe class 30 food. So we have a lot of food manufacturers. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that. Um, one of the other things that on our on our trademark registration forms is that it will ask you for a description of the mark in words. And so you know, think about how you wanna how you wanna describe your mark. Um, again, we don't. It doesn't matter if the colors are red or blue or purple. It, we won't register that. Um, so we just need a description of what the mark looks like. And um, it will also ask you for the, a description of the mode by which or how the mark is being used in commerce. So what business registration is looking for there is they want to see if you know, you're using it on your hang tags for your clothing line or it's appearing on labels or packaging. Um, and then again, back that up with the specimen that you submit. So that's basically what they're looking for. You can even put, um, you know, list down there that you're, um, you know, at using it on for advertising on your website. But they just want to know how you're using that that mark in commerce. Okay. One of the other things that I think is important when we're, I was listening to to John and Dan speak about federal registration is that um, you know, DCCA Business Registration Division, we don't have like an enforcement arm. Like we don't have a Customs and Border Protection sort of enforcement arm. So one of the things that we like to warn people is that you, it's up to the owner of the mark to really police whether somebody's infringing on their mark. DCCA is not going to go out and you know send people de cease and desist letters. You're gonna have to make sure that you're doing that on your own. Um, we, you know, and, and people get frustrated with us sometimes because you know, we do have to approve marks and names that sometimes are a little bit too similar to yours for your comfort. But according to our rule, rules, we have to register it. But again, in that, in that case, there are um, administrative hearings, um, procedures that we can tell you about if you want to. Um, stop somebody from using your name, or if you want to have someone's registration revoked. So there is a, you go to hearings office first, it's an administrative hearings um, procedure, and um, again, you would you know, be hiring your own legal counsel or representing yourself. Um, but the good thing about that process is that we do have some templates on the website that you can kind of look at to see you know, how, to, how to draft those kinds of pleadings, okay? And I just made some notes here because as I was listening to other people speak. Do you mind if I go back and just go through this menu one more time so the online audience can see how I sure. did that? Um, if we start, first of all, you can get to this main website. They have a great domain name. It's called businessregistrations.com. Unlike me, make sure you spell business correctly. It's with one S. <laughs> then, and it's plural, registrations.com. Yeah, registrations 
Yeah, and it, and it is. It will take you to to a government website. You know, a lot of people get nervous that it's that it's not a .gov, but um, it will take you to to Bregg's official website. Okay, and um, that Bregg spotlight on the right hand side again is where you would find you know the best links to get information on our site. Um, the very last one, registration forms, fees, and information. And then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see all of the forms that are associated with names, marks. And you would click on that info and forms link. That would take you to um, the, the trade name, mark, registration forms. And you can click on that complete listing of fillable PDF forms in order to access all the forms that we were talking about before. So none of, none of our registrations are more than like $51. It's um, pretty reasonable. I was just going to ask, if we click on fees, is anybody going to swallow their tongue when they see the <laughs> prices on here? We do have a, it, you can pay an extra $20 if you wanted to have it expedited. So our, our registration um, filing fee of $50 is normal processing. So it's about five to seven working days that we would process um, on average. And then if you wanted to expedite maybe in like two to three days, um, you could pay that extra $20 to do that. So um, I, I spoke with our documents processing manager uh, yesterday before I came here just to um, sort of get some things um, straight in my mind as far as how the processes go there. And um, she said, she, she told me that trademarks are one of the most difficult registrations for them to review. If they're going to reject something, they do a lot of research. Um, you know, there's um, just so many things that they need, to, they need to look at. So she said that they've rejected names or marks based on, um, it's substantially identical to a trade name, um, or it contains, it's purely geographic, um, like there's just the name of a place. Um, without any any other you know um, identifiers, um, if it has a national symbol in the mark somewhere, like the presidential seal, they'll reject it. Um, if it's um, if it has a national flag in it, they'll reject it. So there are different rules. Um, we have a we have the Chapter 482 of the Hawaii Revised Statutes is the is the governing law. But we also have administrative rules that we can also refer you to. And you know, I'm, I, I hate to tell people you have to read the law, but that's probably the best thing um, to do is to read the, the law and see where um, you, know, you might go wrong in, in a registration. Or you can just call us, and we'll, we'll help you, you know, kind of navigate that and point things out to you. So again, did you have a question? Yeah, so we get that question a lot, which is, you know, if you've already got a federal mark, then why register the state mark? And normally, and I think in our situations, it's normally the other way around, where somebody's only got a state mark, and they don't have their federal yet. Um, if you if you have the if you haven't registered at all, m most people start with the state mark because it's easier and it's, you know, cheaper. Um, and but. The, um, I guess one advantage to doing the, the state mark is that you kind of test the waters. It's easier for people to search the state registries to see if anybody's registering something that's similar to their mark. And so you might right away get a cease and desist letter and, and then you can decide you know, whether you want to stick with that mark or you're going to have to you know, fight someone else over the rights for it going forward and possibly disrupt your business. Um, so it, that, that's one method is testing the waters. Um, I think um, it is kind of like a, the state registrations are kind of like a baby step. Does the US trademark office check if there's a registered <coughs> trademark and then what do you do for you to set the mark? No, no. They, they look at the federal register, the, the trademark registration uh, database that I was talking about. Yeah. Is that the same with trade names also? Yes. Boy, how you haven't seen a lot of seasons. So if you follow your uh, state trademark or trade name, actually it's doing yourself a uh, 
it's favor because someone from other state could check and they go ahead and do the federal registration and preempt you. Well, I believe that it that it is still first to use. The, t the test is still going to be first to use. So at least with doing a state registration, you're getting you know a, an official document that claims when you're when you're when you've used the mark. Um, so that's an advantage. So there's your value. Yeah. And let's remember, we're here because this is about exporting, right? But most small companies in Hawaii or any other state, if you're in Kansas or Florida or whatever, when you start a small company, you're very local. You're not necessarily thinking about exporting or even going to another state, maybe not even another county, right? So it's, makes, it's just prudent, good common sense to start uh, your trademarking locally first and then build up from there, right? And I believe that the, the um, federal registrations require you to start doing multi-jurisdictional business after a certain amount of time, right? Before, um, after, or act, after registration, you have to start doing multi-jurisdictional business. I read it was like 90 days or something like that. No, I, I can talk to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, interstate commerce just by virtue of the fact that so many of the people who come to the store or who use the services are from out of state. So you, you don't have to actually go to another state to satisfy the requirement. Okay. So did everybody hear what Seth said? Um, yeah, so so I think the, the probably the largest value is just to be getting use, the date of use on record. You do have okay. so so and, and again we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to me if we get to me, but um, common law countries uh, use it developers' rights as well as registration. Uh, so you can have a use before registration and be the, the better user, depending on where you're using your market is territorial. Uh, so it's not always a simple answer. Uh, so a first use in Hawaii may get you better rights or may not, depending on how extensively that use is. Does that answer your question? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's fact specific. But at least in America, we do have use as the basis to develop trademark rights, whereas in most countries, they do not. Okay, and then lastly, I did want to um, talk about um, or let you know about the Business Action Center uh, services. So at our, at our center, we do have a volunteer attorney who comes every Thursday uh, from our business law section for our Hawaii State Bar Association. And we allow um, a lot, about half an hour for each of our customers to meet one-on-one -on -one with the attorney. And so that's every Thursday from 11 to 1 and um, please call for an appointment. We do, I left some flyers outside and it's basically a screenshot of our, um, our business registration division's webpage, but you can also find um, the Business Action Center phone number on that, on that flyer. Um, we also have the Small Business admi uh, Administration come down to our office every Monday so you can meet with them if you're looking for financing and um, that's every Monday from 10 to 12. So please give us a call if you can, if you're wanting to access any of those services. And again, if you wanted to come in, talk to our staff about these different registrations, please do. We're, my staff is very friendly. <laughs> so you can, you can come and just ask questions if you don't have anything to file. Okay, my computer is going to overheat with the webinar questions that are coming in right now on those comments. Is there anybody on the neighbor islands that can, is there a oh, right. I should mention we have offices on the neighbor islands. Um, we do have a permanent office in Maui. Um, we have a one person on staff there, Angela. She's in the Maui Mall, and that's the, the mall with Long's and Whole Foods and IHOP. So we actually partnered with the uh, Maui County Business Resource 
office and we share space with them in there. So that's, that's an office that's full time. So Monday through Friday, you know, 7.45 to 4.30, um, regular state hours. Uh, in Hilo, I fly up every first and third Thursday of the month and I've partnered there with um, the, the Hawaii County R&D division. So I'm there every Thursday and then I fly to Kona um, on the second Thursday of the month just to help people out on the Kona side. The Big Island is aptly named, <laughs> it's, it's big. So um, we're on both sides um, about three times a month. And um, one of the questions is, are there attorney time slots at any of those places? We don't have um, attorney slots on, on Hawaii, Hawaii Island, but um, in Maui, there, the Maui County office has a lot of resources that they provide um, at, at that office, like SCORE and some other people who can, who can give you advice. But if you really wanted to participate in the Oahu um, volunteer attorney program, you should just call us. And you can sk schedule a time where you can talk on the phone with the attorney at the allotted scheduled time. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a free, you know, they're not gonna draft documents for you. They're not gonna represent you in a live case, but you can ask them questions for 30 minutes, which I think is a pretty good deal. Are there any other questions for Jaina? Because she has to leave early, um, so she's not going to be around at the end for the big panel here. So if you have any specific questions for her, can you raise them now? Otherwise, you know how to find her or the other business action staff. Uh oh there is a question coming in. OK, well, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, next up um, is Seth Reese. I'll, he's a local prominent uh, IP attorney here with Watanabe Ng, and um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to him while I bring up his presentation. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I'll, uh, I know we're a little behind. I'll just go quickly. So let me know if uh, I need to stop early. Um, I think. You know, I, it was occurred to me, Jaina, that the reason why so many businesses uh, forget that annual statement is we, you no longer send us reminders. Just like with the cars and the safety inspections, that's why so many of us get tickets. Whereas the USPTO did not used to send us reminders for renewing their trademarks, and now they do. So now I know why I pay more federal taxes than the state. But. Uh, do you email remind us? Oh. Yellow card first and then the email. Okay, great. Well, I, I guess. Uh, I do I'll get their emails one. and I still um, forget. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to go through really quick. Uh, next slide. I think um, I didn't know exactly what everybody was going to talk about. Unfortunately, they talked about this stuff already, uh, some of it, so we can fly through it. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the geographic scope and then bu budgeting and enforcement. Hopefully some of this will be new. So, wait, 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 you're going too fast. So you can, if you can come back, one more, one more. Okay, so we talked about this already. Trademarks are used with goods. The only difference is for trademarks and service marks is trademarks are used for, with goods and service mark with services. Otherwise they're identical. One thing, there is no trade name on the federal level, okay? But when you use a company name with a good or service, it becomes a trademark or a service mark. So there is a trade name in, on state levels, no trade name on federal num levels, but most company names that you associate with goods or services can be protected as trademarks or service marks on the federal level. Um, we, can, we can go on the next slide. I, and by the way, I never knew about textures. So. One, one thing I like is every, every time I, I come to one of these things, I learn, and so that's good. Um, we talked about you can develop trademark rights through use, but only in common law countries. The United States is one of the common law countries. Another country, interesting enough, is India. We just did a filing in India, and um, in order to get around a prior filed registration there, the uh, Indian Council is suggesting 
we put in some evidence of prior use. So, so only a few countries can you um, rely on use as a basis to, to be first to, to get rights, otherwise it's registration. Now amplifying what John said, you can register in most countries without using it. You cannot register in the United States without using it. However, interestingly, people who are coming in from foreign countries with registered marks can get a US registration without using it, but after five years, or before the sixth year, they have to prove that they're using it in the United States. The other corollary is, and this is in all countries, after three years of non-use, you can file to cancel somebody else's registration. And that comes from something called the Paris Convention, which is a very important intellectual property treaty that was enacted back, back in the 1800s in the United States. Just joined, well, I guess we've, all, we've been a member a long time. And so what that says is you can get registrations in countries without using it, but if you haven't used your mark for three years, you can cancel it. So, so each country is a little bit different. The Philippines requires an affidavit of use after three years. The United States requires proving use after five years if you're coming in from a foreign country, or between the fifth and sixth years if you're coming in from a foreign country. If you're a US applicant, you actually have to prove it before you get your registration. So if you're doing a Madrid application, and maybe I shouldn't jump there yet. If you're doing a Madrid application, you have to show use to get your US registration. You don't have to show use to, to start the Madrid application going to foreign countries. If you never get your US application, everything you do in the foreign country can die. Okay, so you eventually have to use it in the United States. Um, the exception to the first to file. So every other country, or just assume every other country is first to file if you want, if you want rights. And so it's very important to file in a foreign country before somebody else does it using your mark. Uh, there, there are exceptions. This also comes from the Paris Convention for famous and well-known marks. So McDonald's doesn't have mu as much of a problem as we would in a foreign country if they didn't file first. I mean, McDonald's files first. They know, they know to do that. But if they didn't, they can rely on a, on a treaty doctrine called uh, unfair competition for famous and well-known marks. It, it would be difficult for most Hawaii businesses to do that because it's very difficult for Hawaii businesses to qualify as famous or well-known. So let's go to the next slide. So I think as this has already been explained, uh, registrations only go to the borders of a state or a country. So if you file at, with the USPTO, you get protection for throughout the United States. You also get the territories, you get Guam, and uh, Puerto Rico. Um, I think you may get American Samoa too. I, I have to check on that. But um, if you register in the state, you only get protection within the state. The question of if, if you have federal registration, why register in the state? Well, in my mind, there's one, one reason, and that is the blocking function. Because if some, somebody, because the, the state doesn't examine the federal register, when they register people, they'll register federally registered marks that belong to somebody else, okay? So if you register in the state of Hawaii, that will block somebody else from registering your mark. Federal. No, if you have a federal registration, uh, you're protected in, the, in every state. So you can file for infringement against anybody who registers here. Filing an infringement case is an expensive proposition. If you register your mark in Hawaii, then somebody else can't do it. And it's only $51, as explained, if you do it yourself. So, so it may be cost effective. I'll give you an example. When Baywatch came to Hawaii, everybody and their brother registered businesses with the name Baywatch in them because they wanted to be Baywatch Cappy, uh, Taxi, Baywatch uh, Diner. So those are all infringing registrations. The, the Baywatch name belonged to the Hollywood company that, that was making the TV program. By registering Baywatch in, with the DCCA, that blocks infringers. But it doesn't block completely because the DCCA uses the, the standard of substantially identical, whereas trademark rights, the infringement standard is likely of confusion. And so what 
Jaina alluded to is they will register things that are infringing on federal rights or other people's common law rights. And if you don't like it, you have to take action. And you can take action two ways. You can take action through petitions with the DCCA, and they will use the broader standard, which is likelihood of confusion, the same standard that the federal government uses for infringements. Or you can take it to a state court. But it, both are expensive. The DCCA petition is less expensive. And I would say that the DCCA hearings officers, the judges, administrative judges, who hear DCCA trademark cases are very well informed because they hear a lot of them. And they, in a sense, have a better background in trademark law than the state judges who don't hear very many of these cases. Okay. Um, next slide. So, um, okay, we talked a little bit about the geographic reach of the rights. There is no treaty that gives you protection in countries. It only a vehicle for protection in countries. So the Paris right, Paris Convention we talked a little bit about that defines that the, uh, the um, countries agree on uh, minimal intellectual property rights, including trademark rights. The Madrid Protocol, which John and Dan talked substantially about, is a vehicle to getting trademark rights in foreign countries. An exception is the EU trademark, and, and I think uh, John talked a little bit about that. That is a treaty that actually gets you registrations in all EU countries. So for a single filing, which is not very expensive, you can get country uh, protection in 26 or 27 countries. You can't get that through other treaties. Other treaties help you get protection, but doesn't, don't actually get you the protection itself. So, uh, and as we've talked to you a lot about already, uh, to, if you want the protection in each country, whether it's trademarks or patents, you have to go get it one way or another. Next slide. So for federal protection, um, state or federal, we've talked about this already. Uh, the R with a circle around it. Uh, Sarah's not using R with a circle around it uh, for her um, Rapoli mark, but she could if she wanted to. If you're not federally protected, you can't. That's an unfair business practice. You have to use TM or SM, and that's what you should do because that tells the world you regard your mark as, or your designation of origin as a mark. And as we've explained, because use in the United States develop trademark rights, it's, it's a very good thing to use the TM and SM even if you're not federally registered. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the two routes to, and this has been talked about a little bit, there's two ways of getting foreign protection. First, you go directly to the country and file individually in that country. And the other one is through the Madrid Protocol, which is fairly recently enacted. I think it was 89? Um, 89. It was fun because the um, assistant commissioner of the trademarks, um, who later became the commissioner of trademarks, came here to speak about it when it was... Um, recently recently uh, enacted. And so it, it's, it's a great treaty because it makes affordable what used to be unaffordable. In other words, when the uh, US nationals wanted to file in many, many countries, you'd have to pay for foreign attorneys in each country. Now, a lot of that uh, can be done through a single filing. The, the cost per country is much lower. And we don't always have to retain foreign counsel. But the reality is if you do a foreign filing in multiple countries, and you do have to pay for each country, but only the government fees, chances are you're going to get a refusal in one or two countries. And if you really want those countries, you're going to have to hire a foreign counsel to help you get them. Um, so don't expect to be scot-free. Don't expect to just do everything through the US. Um, if you're lucky, it'll go through. but. More, more often than not, if there's multiple countries involved, you're going to get some refusals. Uh, next slide. OK, so budgeting. So it's interesting. So you had advice. John said, always get a trademark attorney. We appreciate that. But the reality is that the USPTO designed the federal registration website so that it's friendly to lay people, interestingly enough. And it gives you all the directions. But so th this is a slide for the state. Uh, we've already heard that it costs $51. I guess the $1 is an archiving fee. So, uh, so that's, and it's five years. They won't, they won't warn you when your five years term is up. 
And so you have to, re you have to calendar it and remember to renew. And most people can do it themselves. You know, we, we do it for clients who ask us to, but I'm not sure it's necessary. It, there's, once in a while there are problematic filings, and so we can help you untangle those. Uh, most of the time uh, it's pretty straightforward. And as you heard, the DCCA will do a lot of hand-holding and help you through the process. Next slide. Federal registrations, I also think these are affordable. I mean, it's, it's uh, some money, but not lots of money, not, certainly not compared to patents. Um, there, there are several different uh, options you have since the internet came along. There's LegalZoom, and there's a discount trademark, like um, certain kind of legal force is, is one of them, but there's several um, companies that are staffed by lawyers who do volume at a discount. And um, this is a reality, and I, you know, I think uh, us traditional lawyers uh, understand this and, and un also understand that, that not, not every business can afford uh, the traditional legal services. So it's, I'm not sure we're welcoming them, but we're certainly accommodating the fact that, that um, that's, that's part of the new commerce, and, and certainly the Internet and the USPTO has, have accommodated um, what is a less expensive uh, avenue to trademark, federal trademark protection. Next slide. So I, I, I know people want numbers, so I tried to give numbers. I'm sure somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong, but, but rather than talking just theoretically and, and with no idea what these things cost, it's my, it's my estimate that LegalZoom and the, the discount uh, services will save you money, but but, but we're not multiple times what uh, the discount services might be. So uh, I think law firms for a single mark in one class, and Dan, I don't know if, if this is within the range of what you think uh, your firm might charge, because Dan comes from a very large, uh, important IP firm on the mainland, and Hawaii firms are always cheaper than that, but you know, they're, we're within the range, so that'll give you some idea of uh, what you might be paying if you hire an attorney as opposed to going through a discount firm. You know, in my mind, you can file trademarks yourself and a certain percent will go through with no problem. There's another percentage that'll go through with LegalZoom or a discount broker. And then there's some, some problematic areas where if you hire you know, somebody with a lot of experience, you're gonna get through and you might not with the discount services. We, we do get Clients coming to us with a legal Zoom filing that ran into problems, and we can sometimes fix it, and we sometimes can't. So I'm not going to say they don't add value because they do. It's a question of the level of sophistication, and oftentimes you won't know that you have a problem mark. It's it's almost a matter of luck whether the mark you have is going to run into problems or not. Um, what I did notice is a lot of these uh, solicitations. That, that people receive for renewals, their, their pricing is actually more expensive than ours. So be very wary of what might look like a deal, particularly in the renewal area, which is not at all a deal. Okay, I mean, one, well, one, area, one, one way of looking at it is professional fees shouldn't be much different than twice, two or three times the government fees. Particularly in a renewal, the professional fees shouldn't be that substantial relative to the government fees. Next slide. Okay, Madrid filing, a rule of thumb is if there's, if you're going for more than two Madrid com countries, you'll probably save money by filing a Madrid application relative to an individual country application. Uh, you can actually calculate the government fees online using this um, website. So if you want to get a ballpark of what the government part will cost you, Go to the website and you'll get a, a census. So they talked about filing in seven, 70 countries. You can, but each government will take a few hundred dollars, um, depending on the government. And uh, so it, it's, you know, it will add up. Um, government fees for filing Madrid's are not that significant unless it runs into problems. So a lot of times the, the professional fee, our fee for filing in Madrid will be less than the government fees simply because we're doing a one-step application initially, but the governments are each taking a piece. 
And so, so we're relatively inexpensive until you run into problems with your Madrids and then you get bills from the foreign correspondents and us trying to work through those problems. So again, you may, you may or may not encounter uh, refusals from the governments. Next slide. Okay, and so this, is, this just explains if you go country by country what you can expect financially. So I know, you know, when you're, you have no idea, but, but the fees really do vary um, by country and by law firm. There's some large law firms in developed countries that will charge, just like in the United States, you know, one third more or, or, or sometimes, or two thirds more than, than, a, than a discount firm and you get different quality and sophistication of services. And it's our job uh, when we coordinate for you with local counsel to help you select the right foreign counsel and to work with the foreign counsel to streamline the application, make it, uh, make it keep, keep the cost down, almost like a project manager in a constru construction site. We can't do the foreign work, but we can help facilitate the application, make sure there's no cost overruns, and when it runs into problems, help explain those problems and help work through the problems. Um, so you, things you can do, I, I mean, some, occasionally you might want to go directly to a foreign firm without going through a U.S. firm. I'm not sure that's always advisable, but if you do, you can ask for fee schedules, and, and uh, a lot of times the foreign firm may, may want their money up front because they don't know who you are and, you know, they don't want to be caught uh, with, with, a, with a cost that is not reimbursed. Uh, next slide. Enforcement. Okay, so... So, so enforcement is different than registration. You can get a, re get a registration, but it doesn't mean people stop infringing you. You might, you know, you, you still have to enforce it if you want people to stop infringing. Sometimes registrations go a long way to stop people because people have respect for government documents, but, but not always. So there's different levels of escalation for dealing with infringers. The first is a cease and desist letter. It's very common. There's registration with border control, and that was discussed a little bit about uh, today, you know, preventing infringing goods from coming in, and contested case proceedings, which are basically trademark office proceedings and infringement proceedings in courts. Next slide. So cease and desist letters are pretty straightforward. It should be written by local counsel with authority to to uh, take an enforcement action, uh, so Americans shouldn't really be sending letters to China, but you can, but it's not recommended. Um, it'll get more respect usually if there's a, especially a, um, a well-known law firm, local law firm is, is more likely to have effect. Uh, the effectiveness varies. You know, it's interesting because a lot of it's, you know, well, the enforcement in Asia is not so good, but, you know, we, we have problems here too. You know, we can send cease and desist letters and they can be ignored. Um, and then the client has to decide if they want to pony up big money for, for a lawsuit. So, so it's, it's, you know, the, the enforcement is v variable across countries, but it's not like it's all good in one place and all bad in the other. There, there are uh, different, different levels. Uh, next slide. Registration of border control we talked about. Each country has different laws on this. Um, but that's to prevent incoming. So if you, if if you're sh shipping out, I don't I don't believe border control will normally police that. So for example, if you have a infringement problem in China, registering your mark with the border patrol in China, and I'm not sure they even do this. I don't know, Dan, if you know, but I don't think they will police on the way out. Normally, you don't police on the way out. But registration with the border control is inexpensive for policing on the way in. It's inexpensive to do the registration. Then you have the government policing things for you, which is much better than you know spending spending the money in a civil action to police it for yourself. So it's it's a very handy um, tool. If it's available and it works for you, you should do it. Next slide. Contested proceedings. So the tra trademark, uh, the cancellation and opposition proceedings. It's a way in foreign countries to get rid of a bad registration, if you can do it. It's affordable in the sense that it's, we're talking thousands of dollars and not tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Infringement lawsuits, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there, you know, this, that's the last step, and it's, it takes a big budget. Um, you can start something, and that might work, but it may not. And to actually go to a judgment on a contested case can be very expensive in the United States. It can be expensive in foreign countries. It's going to be more expensive, much more expensive in the United States than in most foreign countries, but it'll still cost a lot. Next slide. And I guess my comments on enforcement across cultures is there, there's, there's two things going on. One, the, 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 the customs and the culture of the country um, ha have a big impact on, on what people do and, and, and the kind of infringements that take place. So, so we know, for example, that in Asia there is a bigger problem of, of IP infringement in general than in the United States. But it doesn't mean it's a lawless country, and in, particularly in China, there's been some significant judgments in favor of trademark owners. But, but, the, but that doesn't necessarily change the culture overnight. So you can get judgments. So some people ask me, why register in China? Well, one reason it's inexpensive. Another reason is it, it'll, it'll be of some use. Uh, why get a judgment in China? Well. Again, it's inexpensive relative to getting a judgment in the United States, and it will send a message. Will it uh, have the same impact as in the United States or in Europe? Probably not. Is it changing over time? Yes, it probably is improving a little over time. So in other words, don't have false expectations about enforcement in other countries. Um, the best, I think the best thing you can do is form relationships with foreign counsel so that they know you and you know them, and then ask them very pointed questions. You know, how much will this cost? What it'll get me? What can I expect? And our experience with most foreign counsel is that they, they will be upfront and professional, just like, like uh, counsel in the United States. Um, next slide. Ex other examples is there have been cases, particularly in South America, where we believe that trademark firms, patent trademark firms, may, be, may collude. So somebody will file an opposition proceeding against your mark and, and be doing it to generate funds, for example. So, so, there, so I'm, I'm distrustful of South America. I, I know there's good firms there, but, but you have to be careful. Um, one, one other example, and I'm sure we've all gotten these, uh, these emails. So even though I think the, in my experience, the patent and trademark practice in, in China and Asia is, is um, generally honest and professional, there are things going on there. For example, um, uh, a lot of fraudulent domain name solicitations. So be very careful about solicitations. You'll get a lot of stuff. If you have a federal trademark registration, you'll get a lot of mailings that sure look real, and they're not. So uh, be careful. So that, that's, that's the end, I think. Next slide. And this is my disclaimer. So if I got anything wrong, you. <laughs> so, no, hopefully I didn't. But um, thank you for your attention. Um, that closes our talks by individual panelists, and then I'd like to open it up for discussions for the panel in general. Is Mitzi here? Come on up, Mitzi, and join the panel. Mitzi, again, is the Maui cookie lady. Let's get started with the panel discussion. Um, what I'd like to do, if, you, if we can, think about a small company here in Hawaii, tiny little company, just starting out. Where do, what's the first step? Where do they go from here? And let's think, most of our companies in Hawaii will think in terms of exports, they think Japan first. They don't think Canada, they don't think Mexico or any of that NAFTA activity, which, excuse me, in my opinion, would be easier. They automatically think Japan. And this is, these are companies that I consult to in my private business or through HPEC. Automatically, when they hear the word export, something comes into brain and out comes Japan. That's just the way it works. 
for most companies. So if you think about it that way, where would a small company start with trademark registration as just a little organization here? Do they go to the state first? Um, and then let's take it one step further. They probably want to export to Japan. If they're successful there, they might think about Korea, Taiwan, maybe China, but so many companies are scared about China for lots of reasons you sort of alluded to. Um, can we start the conversation there? Like why, let's, let's just say, um, let's start with Sarah and Mitzi. I know you guys are interested in Japan, right? Is that your first foreign market, for example? Isn't it? Oh, sorry, you guys need a microphone. And we have to do this karaoke style, I'm sorry. Well, when I first started, I, I just went to uh, Maui Mall, which um, they had talked about earlier. And I'm glad I went and um, I registered with the state because the first name I submitted was rejected. And um, it was the Cookie Lady of Maui. So they said it was too similar to another name. So then I went back and did the Maui Cookie Lady that was accepted. And um, I'm glad I did that before investing in any like, you know, website or business cards. Um, about two years after I started my business, uh, my background is I'm a school teacher. I was never meant to be a business. Uh, I was a fundraiser for my father who passed away. Um, it was only meant to be for a few months at a farmer's market, and we just grew quickly. So I did everything backwards without a business plan, without really knowing anything about business. Um, and about two years after we started, I was getting inquiries from the Middle East. So we had... Um, uh, business people reach out from uh, Doha, uh, Dubai, and Saudi. I uh, ended up doing uh, three different Skype business meetings with three three different business firms. They um, really have a sweet tooth, uh, their culture, and they wanted they didn't have any Hawaii products over there. So um, I never thought about going to another country, but when um, after doing the meetings and learning that it was very difficult to protect myself over there, I didn't pursue it, and I kind of just... Um, you know, just focused here in Hawaii. But uh, just this year, um, we're starting to get more of a social media following uh, in Japan. So, and I think that our product would do really well there since they don't, um, that I know of, have a lot of Maui cookie companies over there. So that is now my interest and in why I'm here today to learn more about that. But uh, to answer your question, no, my, the first inquiries I had um, were from three countries in the Middle East. But yeah, now it's to be had. Um, no, I, I mean, just I would just say at yeah, Japan, it's um, I think the correlation for wrapping and gift wrap is very strong, and um, because so many Japanese tourists have come here and bought our product and expressed interest, um, that that drove our decision. I think anything. that that's so typical of the local companies here, right? So are you, what's your trademark, what's your IP portfolio? Do you have any th protection in Japan or? No, but I am pursuing it. Okay, Yeah. good, good. Okay, so let's ask the, the experts then. If you were a small company here and you were just starting out, what should you do? Well, I think, I think your scenario is difficult because you know, it really depends on your budget. I would not file state if, you, if I'm even, even already thinking about a foreign country because it just won't get me any mileage. I would try to find the funds to get a federal registration so I have six months within which to file foreign and be able to um, claim priority back to the date I filed federal. So I, I would do that. Now, the next step is tougher because if I was going to be filing in Japan, but maybe not anywhere else for a few years, maybe I'd file directly into Japan because if you get the right connection, that'll only cost you another fifteen hundred, maybe two thousand dollars at the most, and you can get Japan. You know, you'll have Japan, and you don't have to worry about somebody filing first. But the problem is, if you're also thinking about other foreign countries and you can budget it, why not file in Madrid and for another? $2,000 maybe, and I know I'm giving ballparks, but that's reasonable for three other Asian countries. 
I'll all of a sudden have the potential for four Asian countries for, for that budget, and I, I won't have to worry about those countries. So, so it really depends on what you're willing to budget and how much and how quickly you think you're going to the foreign countries. I would make a comment about Middle East. I think it was on one of my slides. Of all the countries in the world, the Middle Eastern countries still have an archaic power of attorney requirement that requires us in Hawaii to go get a notarization on a power of attorney and then go to the circuit court to get it, um, to get it uh, validated and then go to the lieutenant governor to get it validated and then go to the State Department in D.C. to go to validate it, then go to the embassy either in New York or L.A. depending on which Middle Eastern country and then you pay hundreds of dollars in fees for the stamp from the consulate and then you pay thousand dollars of filing fees in the Middle East. Now, those poor trademark attorneys in those countries make $1,000 and the government makes many thousand dollars for a filing. So I know these are very important countries commercially. I know you need your trademark registered there if you're going to do business there. But it is the most painful experience financially and also for the trademark attorney because it's no fun for me to run through all those government Agencies, I don't make money. I just have to worry about screwing up and not, not getting something done in time. So, so, so hopefully they will change one day. But, you know, many countries in the old days used to be like that with formal power of attorneys. Now we, we have kind of automatic power of attorneys and we either get something simple filed or we can just represent to the agency. But, uh, so I guess you didn't have to go through that process yet. Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting because it's scary. But on the other hand, it's a wonderful commercial market. And so you just got to pay those fees if you want, if you want to be playing in it. So. Are there countries that you found, okay, those are complicated countries. Are there countries you found that are easy? Most countries are easy. Really? But each country has their own difficulties. Um, for, for example, Ch China, China raises a lot of um, likelihood of confusion, objections, but they also have subclasses so that your mark is examined within a subclass. And so that's why you really need the foreign car. In difficult filings, you really need a good foreign correspondence to guide you to, you know, a lot of times we have, have to use creative um, strategies to get something through. Not every mark can get through to, in every country. So. But, but, the, but in terms of for, formal requirements, it's only the Middle Eastern com countries that, that seem to keep those. There's a few South, sometimes in South America, I, I don't do filings much in South America, but so, South America might have, have a, a little bit of a formal procedure still, but not, not, not that bad. And I'm, I'm trying to put it in perspective yeah. of our two entrepreneurs here. Would they have a difficult filing? Well, we, you know, okay, so, so there are rejections, different countries like, I mean, you wouldn't know, and I didn't know until I started filing in some of these countries, but Norway considers everything descriptive for some reason. I don't know why. So it's really hard to get marks that, that have meaning through Norway. Now, the United States has a, a doctrine that you've heard about. Um, generic marks aren't registrable. Descriptive marks can only be registered if you can show secondary meaning and acquire distinctiveness. Um, and I, and suggest, suggestive marks are registrable. Now, Norway thinks a suggestive mark is generic for some reason, and they just say no. And we hire people to argue it, and half the time they still say no. Um, Asia, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's, you know, we're, we're registering English language marks into Asia, and so I'm not sure if they, if they use a different standard because, you know, that's not their native language, and sometimes foreign council will tell us, oh, why don't you do a, uh, you know, a native language registration at the same time or alternatively? But, but Asian countries also seem to refuse marks more often on them being descriptive. So that's an example. But you always have the you know, similarity to somebody else's registered mark. That that's happens throughout the world. So, so it's, it's almost impossible to predict. Sometimes we can predict because something's very descriptive. That's easy. But otherwise, we need a search or, or a professional opinion from foreign counsel before we know if something's a problem or not. In Asia in particular, just because I know the audience will be a little more interested in Asia, is there any kind of domino effect with filing? Like, for example, if you file in Japan and you're approved in Japan, does it no. make it easier in Korea than, than No. 
Um, the only time is sometimes we'll get a descriptive objection, and if we can show we've successfully registered in many countries anywhere, we can persuade the trademark office in that country to decide it. Well, it wasn't all that descriptive, you can have it. But there is nothing where that I've experienced where one Asian country will defer to another Asian country. Every, every country is proud. <laughs> and so, you sure. know, they, they don't think that, you know, other than that, that concept of you can overcome descriptiveness by showing other countries have recognized it. And so you're known in other places. Thanks. So um, just a quick aside on the patent side is we have some work sharing programs with the USPTO in Japan, the Japanese Patent Office, and with the Korea IP Office. Um, and, you know, to your point that every, every country, you know, likes to do their own search, and that's true. But one of the things we're doing through this collaboration pilot, again, on, on the patent side, is the examiners do their search and then they share the results with each other before they send out an office action uh, on those cases so that they have the benefit of, um, of examiner search in multiple offices. So we've been trying that through a work sharing program, so we're hoping that, that there's headway, so perhaps we can explore that opportunity on the trademark side as well. Um, I, I want to take a moment to go back to the, the original question on, you know, what do you do when you're just getting started? And um, I, I, I was remiss to mention this because we were short of time at the, at the end of our presentation, but I did want to specifically highlight and tout the, on the USPTO's website, the trademark self-help videos are amazing. If you, it, it, the patent ones are good. The trademark ones, they've really gone through some extra steps to, um, to really break down all of the different aspects of trademark registration, where they even have, some of them will walk you through how to fill out the form. Um, so it really takes you from soup to nuts of how to file your trademark application, how to figure out which, you know, you know how to do a search, you know, how to, um, you know, even, even assistance with the Madrid Protocol. And it's all through um, a mechanism called the Trademark Information Network, uh, T-M-I-N. And, uh, and the Trademark Information Network is basically built like a news broadcast where they kind of address what the problem is and show how to get to the solution. So they're really a good, good um, workshop, essentially online workshop. And they're in shorter snippets so that you can take some of your time, focus on what you want to learn. And then and the flip side is we have, a tra we have a patent assistance center as well as a trademark assistance center. But the trademark assistance center will literally on the phone help walk you through how to do your filing. So Forgive me in advance for putting you on the spot. Do you, would you know where those are? Yeah, Brian? scroll down. Uh, okay, scroll back up. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, click on, go up a little bit more, sorry, on the trademark side. Click on trademark basics. It might, oh, actually, no, click on the trademark's name up, yeah, right there. That's it. And then scroll down. Trademark video is right in the oh, center wow, here. Oh, that's great. And, um, and there's also a Trademark just, Basics, Trademark Assistance Center, a lot of great stuff and, and different steps of you, know, you haven't started your application, you're filling out your application, you've successfully filed, and what are some things. So they're all you know, run between five to 15 minutes roughly, so a good way to, to really break down the, um, the that's, whole process. That's great. So, and kind of to the point earlier is, yeah, the, you know, you, yes, you can do it yourself, but if something goes wrong, you're going to want to get an attorney. Um, but, but many people are very successful in navigating the process on their own. Patents, you need a, <laughs> patents question, are much more complicated. Question right here in front. <laughs> can I remind the speakers, for the online audience, please repeat the question because they can't hear the audience well. We spent a lot of time talking about trademark registration, but not intellectual property registration. I can see Sarah sending paper to Japan or China, and, and she's got her trademark registered, but I could see Chinese making those beautiful designs, and I could see Chinese-made uh, Hawaiian designs, your exact design being made in China by the Chinese. I've had the experience of having our Cozumel map distributor printing off Cozumel maps in a, in a color print shop in, in Mexico, and how do I protect intellectual property? If I make a map of Hong Kong, how do I stop that map from being made in China the week after? How do, we, how do you protect copyrights and intellectual property? Yeah, so, yeah, the question was how to protect IP uh, and intellectual property. So intellectual property, you know, 
is the overarching umbrella. Under that umbrella is patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and then the different types of patents, utility patents, design patents, copyrights as well. So, uh, and, and to our point earlier is you may need more than one form of IP to protect your brand, to protect your product, to protect your innovation. So, um, you know, I'm happy to pass it over to Sarah, but my, you know, you know Rapidly is definitely her trademark, but all of her printed works are, would be covered under copyrights. They're printed works, you know, you know on, on, a, on, on a medium. So there is copyright protection, and, um, and I'm not a copyright expert, but maybe Seth can talk more about this. Um, yeah, let me pass it to Seth, and he'll say how, because copyrights do have some international reach as well. Okay, so um, yeah, so so the good news, and when you talked about IP, but you were describing copyrightable subject matter designs, and that's, the good news is copyright is automatic. The better news is it's automatic in almost every country in the world, and there's reciprocal protection pursuant to what's something called the Berne Convention. The Berne Convention was adopted; it goes back to the 1800s, but the United States waited till maybe 20 years ago to adopt it, and that's because they had their own convention called the Universal Copyright Con the UCC, and nobody joined our convention, so we decided to join theirs. And the reason why I know all this is because I, I, I taught, taught in Malaysia, and that was just when these things were being debated, because, you know, the, the Malaysia was deciding to, you know, wh whose copyright to, to um, respect. But, but these days, it's all automatic and it's everywhere. And so you don't have to file registration. You can file a registration in the United States and you, you should to get the higher damages and to be able to f file for infringement, but you don't have to. And you don't have to be worried about registering in other countries because no other country does registrations except the Philippines and they only do it because they copied us. So, so basically, you're okay. The problem is enforcement. So how do you enforce it? You, contact a reputable firm in China and say, what's it gonna cost and what's it gonna get me? So that goes back to the enforcement call. So the good news is you don't have to do anything extra. If you want to sue somebody, you can, anywhere, almost anywhere. And the bad news is it'll still cost you something and it may or may not get rid of the problem. So. Please. If, if I can just add real, real, real quickly, because there was a previous comment on you know, getting trademark protection in China. And you know, one of the, the bigger issues, not just within China, but in, in many countries, is trademark squatting, where they'll see the trademark being registered in the US. And if you don't have rights or haven't tried to get rights in those countries, um, there's a possibility that someone else in that country will just copy your mark and, and be able to get a registration in, in that respective country. So there's a way to preempt that um, by, you know, it's by taking advantage of the Madrid protocols and the priority dates and, and all that, but it does get expensive, so it's all part of your overall strategy. And you know, I, I can't give advice, but we just know that, that it is an issue in trying to get your mark in a country um, you know, is uh, that, that someone else has squatted on that, that, that mark, you know, can be very difficult. So, uh, uh, I just want to share with you uh, something that uh, there's a major company in Hawaii that uh, tried to go to China. What they did is they go to Hong Kong and Singapore. They got the order in Hawaii can go to Singapore and Hong Kong without changing the name. Okay? And Singapore and Hong Kong companies are the major distributor in China. So what you do is, what they are so successful is, they pay a very reputable company in Singapore. <coughs> they know all the trade, all the legal things in China, and they take the product into, into China. Use Hong Kong as an example. Hong Kong has 50 million visitors to Hong Kong, which is smaller than the island of Hawaii. And they have about half a million Japanese visitors going to Hong Kong, high spending visitors from Japan to target the Japanese market. And there's about a million visitors going to Taiwan because of the cruise facility. So you do not necessarily have to go to Japan to sell to Japanese. And that's what this major company in Hawaii, uh, a major Japanese company. So that's how they do it. The, the business model is for where the Japanese tourists 
but they don't necessarily has to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. They go wherever the Japanese tourists go, they are there partnering with Singapore company, Hong Kong company that know how to do it. And if anything goes wrong, Hong Kong and Singapore is a common law state. They take them to court in Hong Kong and Singapore, which is much easier than take them to court in China. Good we're here trying to promote exports, and we're describing the exporter's dilemma. How are you going to protect your IP? How is she going to protect her designs in, in uh, any country in Asia? How do we do that? And it sounds like it's the Wild West, and we're not going to do that. <laughs> Find the right path. Well, you know, what, one, one issue is, well, I guess, I guess for ex exporting, that's true. But you have to consider what your market is and how to protect your market. So. So if you're making, if you're manufacturing in China and bringing into other countries, you protect, you protect those countries, not necessarily China. Uh, if you want to, if you want to sell in China, yes, you have to protect it in China. But but if you're if you're manufacturing here, you can you can to a certain extent control what's coming out of the United States. But I mean, you you need you need to do IP protection, um, you know, in relevant relevant to, to, to where you're going and where you're coming from. I just want to add to this, and this is not legal at all, but I would say that I am protecting myself by building up my brand and having a very strong brand, and I will trademark that brand in Japan. I'm working on that, and I feel like uh, consumers, um, especially for our you know, we're very value driven. Um, they're going to want to buy the Rapoli brand. And of course, if we see knockoffs, then I will pursue legal course, but, you know, knocking off patterns and stuff, yeah, that's, that's just difficult. Please. So, as I understand it, what you just said, is that you have trademarked your name of your company, and that's one of your IP, but all the designs that you come up with, you're not going to trademark every single one. No, you can't do that. But then it's copied automatically by the copyright law, right? And so just what you said then is that um, any foreign country, you know, some pair, some somewhere in some town in China is making that same copy. <laughs> And that goes back to the, those pamphlets I left earlier on the IP attaches. Um, so we actually have three in China and one in Thailand that cover kind of the, the Asia uh, ge more generally, and we have one in India. And so they're in the embassies, really there to help U.S. businesses with the enforcement of their IP on on the ground in those regions. China, by the way, is, has come a long way. Um, they do get a lot of bad press, and a lot of it is deserved, but they've come a long way in by, by trying to be part of WTO and, and trying to um, be taken seriously. They've come a long way in um, protecting IP rights, um, including of foreign, foreign nationals and people who have registered from, out, from abroad, people who have registered in China. So it's not, it's, it's still the West, but it's not as wild as it used to be. But don't, don't you think things will get better with China as more Chinese brands develop and they need the rest of the world to protect the Chinese brands that are being exported? I think that that will have a big impact as China's more integrated into the global economy. Yeah, and when you look at who's filing patent applications in the US and who's filing them in Europe, it's the Chinese. Sure. There's a question way in the back, back there. Sorry, um, I know this is probably going to open up a can of worms, but um, when it comes to um, sourcing and manufacturing with companies like Alibaba and AliExpress, how do you, how does one um, protect themselves um, despite like even NDAs? Like if, if you're contacting those companies, 
shoe source and manufacturer through them and you present them with the NDA, that's great, but how do you present your design to them or your idea to them and manufacturing through them um, without them taking your idea or your invention or your goods and, and reproducing them? Because if you go on those sites, you can see um, other companies that are very prevalent here um, in the United States and you can see their logos and stuff on the things that they're trying to sell to you and um, you can tell that those manufacturers have had those customers before based on, on, on that brand. So how do you protect yourself and, and put those with those platforms and those sources? Sorry. No, that's a great the question, question was how do you how do you protect yourself um, even when you sign an, an NDA when you're going to disclose your trade secrets or your ideas to um, to an overseas company who may not be um, willing to honor the, the agreement? Um, and the answer is you can't, really. You're taking a business risk. And, uh, you know, you have, presumably you have rights in contract, so if they were to violate the, the non-disclosure agreement, you could sue them. Um, if they're in, if you, if you can, you know, if you can trust the, if the court, the jurisdiction in which you're going to have to sue them. Um, you know, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned Alibaba, um, but you know Alibaba is not to, not to speak specifically about them, but but companies like Alibaba who have U, U.S. presence, you know, could be sued in the U.S. I mean they have they have operations here, and and probably there's jurisdiction to sue them. So, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna disclose to a, a more fly by night operation that only exists in you know Vietnam or China or something like that, then you are taking a risk that they'll disregard the their obligations, and and you know it's a problem. And, and there's only so much you can do about it. You can file a patent application here and, you know, e extend it abroad. That's the, the best advice always is file your patent before you disclose to anybody. Um, but there's always going to be business risk that, that the other party is not going to honor the obligations. Quick, uh, here's a question online. Uh, there's a lot of questions coming in from Maui, so just bear with me. For the Maui cookie lady, are you doing... International business, we covered that a bit. And where are you packaging and labeling your products to send domestically in the U.S. and then internationally? So uh, we've built our own commercial kitchen. I'm very fortunate. Um, we built it from the ground up and got it uh, passed uh, with Department of Health and Planning and Wastewater. Um, I know that um, getting a kitchen on our island, I don't know about Oahu, is uh, sometimes can be challenging. Uh, but if you have a food startup and you're interested in um, getting started, there's a food innovation center at Maui Community College at, at University of Hawaii. Uh, I've also, um, we're developing cookie butters right now. It's been a two-year passion. Uh, it's a top seller for Trader Joe's, and we're doing um, tropical cookie butters uh, that I know of the only tropical uh, nationwide and the first from uh, Hawaii. So I've been actively also using the Food Innovation Center uh, lab. It's a kind of a kitchen test lab, but they, um, if you take a class with them, they'll allow you to use that kitchen facility. Um, they just got a, a multi-million dollar grant and they're gonna be uh, bringing in a lot of um, packaging, uh, fulfilling type of resources. Um, that I'll be using for our cookie butters and that anybody can use uh, if you take a class with them. And there are a lot of really great startup classes and it's a wonderful place to start. Well, pack, on the topic of packaging though, is there ever any reason, I'm sure there is, but do you have any examples of patenting or trademarking or protecting your packaging? Because packaging is can be a critical marketing item, right? There's value in packaging. And I know the Maui Cookie Lady, well, you, you make packaging, but the Maui Cookie Lady has very nice packaging, so. Yeah, you know, um, so it's, it's, for me, it was an expense that I was avoiding, because uh, I didn't know, uh, you know, the food business is so risky as it is, and I was thinking in my head, if I'm gonna spend all this money protecting my, and doing, you know, I already did the state, but the federal trademark, um, how long is it going to take me to uh, to make that money back? But um, you know, we're we've built our business on social media. Uh, I like it because it's free, um, and we've um, gotten some great success building, and uh, that also exposes you as well. So we had um, when I first started, it was a a company out of Malaysia, I believe, had copied our logo. Um, all I did was block them. Um, 
on Instagram, but um, a few months ago, um, I found a company that follows us on Instagram that took our exact logo. Um, I believe they were in Jordan, but everything was in Arabic. So once I saw that, my, you know, my heart just stopped because it was all my hard work and even had the little plumeria uh, flower behind their ear. It was the exact same logo. Um, they just called themselves, uh, it was an Arabic word, uh, cookie lady. Um, they had the heart, everything. It had me on there with my cookies. So I, um, it was a blessing. I, I blocked them, and then I announced on Instagram and Facebook and that they had done this. And I'm not sure maybe somebody had contacted them because they took it down shortly after. But uh, it did encourage me to go and get protected. So I did get protected. I, I went through an attorney. It just made it a lot more simpler. Uh, just within, um, you know, United States, so I'm not protected internationally. So that is my next uh, goal, especially if we're going to be shipping over there. Can I ask, John, is, would, it's in Arabic, so that's many different countries, but could she have gotten some help from, I don't know, an embassy in Jordan or the U.S. embassy, or is there anybody there that, in, is there infrastructure set up that way in embassies to help? Yeah, so not all the embassies, but um, but we do have an IP attache in the Middle East that covers the Middle Eastern region, so they're, they're a good person to talk to about seeing what t what types of actions you might have. Again, because I've, every IP system, while they're similar, are very different in many regards, and we've heard about a lot of the differences today. Um, so they those attaches know how to navigate the particular countries and um, in, within their region and may be able to give you some advice on how to take action, uh, whether it be through no notice and takedown, if it's an online um, marketing uh, thing, but also to, to pre prevent um, the, the product from being even exported into the U.S. if that if that's a uh, you know a risk as well and so there was you know we talked a little bit about you know if you have the trade federally registered trademark you can record it in in customs we have heard there was actually um, a one success story I heard of recently and uh, where and I, I believe it was in China but maybe somewhere else in Asia um, where they were actually able to seize the goods before they left the port. In Asia, on their way to U.S., so so we started to see some really good enforcement um, uh, actions taking place in you know the regions around the world where, where enforcement is difficult, and so I think that all of that is is heading in the right direction. Um, but again, like when you're you know you know trying to get your business up and up and running, there's a lot of other factors you have to consider before trying to chase down people that are trying to copy you. And, and it does get challenging and it does get complicated. Um, but, but you know, my, my view has always been take advantage of the resources that are available to you and try not to do it on your own. And, and so the government has a lot of those resources that can help guide you or at least tell you these are the steps that you want to go through in order to get the best results. And so that's one of the reasons that we've expanded our attache program over the past decade, and, um, and they've really been such a great resource for American industries. One more follow-on question from Maui. For either of um, Rapoli or the Maui Cookie Lady, have your companies had any problems with the trademark or patenting, I, let's say, intellectual property procedures, filing or that sort of thing, being that you're on Maui, which is sort of a degree of freedom away from Honolulu, which is a 5,000 mile degree of freedom from Washington, D.C. Are there, are there any issues you guys have run into? Uh, you know, I, I haven't. I have a, a great attorney on Maui, and um, if you have a good attorney, they'll make you feel comfortable, simplify it, and do all the work for you, and you just pay the fee. So I've very fortunate, I uh, found a great attorney to help me. Um, but it's also pretty new. We, we just filed after the, you know, in January, and so we're just newly protected, but I, I personally haven't had any challenges. There's a, auto, automatically people are typing in, um, please share that name of that attorney when you get back to Maui. <laughs> yeah, please. I recently had a, a trademark enforcement issue with, uh, in Vietnam, and the, the local council there, the hourly fees were somewhere between three and four times 
what the U.S. fees would be in Los Angeles. Uh, and so for this particular client, it made the form of the legal counsel situation prohibited. And so I used uh, the U.S. Commercial Service, and the U.S. Commercial Service just slapped this in French and Vietnamese operation around through the government brutally, and, and they, took, they took it down. The other point I wanted to make is that I hope everybody in the room realizes that you can see the importance of the whole IP issues with respect to export. And as far as I'm concerned, we're all now living in the first time in my career where I have ever seen the U.S. government start to push back and protect on the IP side uh, with some of our uh, problem children from Asia or problem child, if you will. And so I'm going to go to Washington um, the end of May as a part of my representative of the National District on the National Board, uh, along with the Hawaii Export Council, and talk to some of our congressional leaders. And so if some of you have some issues with respect to trade and trade policy, this is a current issue that we're in a major sword fight with internally within the National District Export Council. Um, and but there's a lot on these major phone conference calls that I hear. Enormous support for the protection of IP developed by U.S. companies. And so this is a current issue now that you see in the media and the press. And I just want to thank all of you for a superb, um, superb warning here because this is critically important to the, the little um, the little people who export. It's easy for Coca-Cola, but tough for um, uh, the Maui cookie lady and others. One, thank you. So who is your attorney on Maui? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so um, for the Maui uh, peeps over there, uh, the attorney I use is Jamil uh, Newworth, um, and he is uh, also... Um, he just also started a uh, with two other gentlemen on Maui, um, a cancer... Uh, survivor uh, nonprofit, so he's been in the press quite a bit the last couple months for the big mural that uh, they did in Wailuku. Uh, he's a really good heart, um, and he's uh, very affordable. Uh, the first consultation was free, so it's with uh, Sutherland and New Earth in Wailuku. Uh, so Jamil New Earth, and if um, you didn't catch that, or if you have any follow-up questions, you just um, message me through social media or my website, and I'll I'll get you that name and contact. Great. Please. Louder, please. Somebody like Martha Stewart. So she's copyright and trademark. And she could do all three. Would she just. So, like, when we see Martha Stewart, we recognize her name, like Coca Cola. So she would be wise enough to, to trademark her name. Because you can't. Um, in your name. I mean, I mean, when she's making all these products, so what, an example of, you know, someone that's kind of been able to protect some intellectual property broadly, what, what, is, what, is, um, what did she do? How is that? I, I will say it's kind of piggyback, piggybacking on that, but when I first uh, looked at the protecting my name, uh, what was told to me, and I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate, is that Maui cannot be trademarked cookie or lady. These are all three broad terms. I would have to show consecutive use for five years in a row, uh, associating uh, those words together with my brand. Um, and I know that the Honolulu Cookie Company also is in the same situation, but they have been in use for so long that it's now they're able to pr protect that. Is, is that accurate? Um, yeah, and on um, the name itself, the one thing that comes to mind is like, I think it's Martha Stewart Living that is the trademark as opposed to, I'm not sure if her name itself is trademark, but... Uh, so this is, a, this is a question for Seth, uh, so I'll pass it to him in a second. But, the, but there is, I mean, there's, there, there is a, in, in many states, like California, for example, there is a right of publicity that is considered an IP right. So um, you can't misappropriate someone's image um, if they're alive. So for example, I can't, um, I couldn't launch a product and put Martha Stewart's face on my product literature and imply that she's endorsed it or that I have some connection with her. But she, she has a right to her image. And that's a, that's a state law right. So, so Hawaii has always had a publicity right in common law. But three years ago, the legislature 
defined it, so it's I'm a 482p or something. It it, it extends 70 years after um, after a person's death, I, I believe, or uh, a period of time after a person's death. So you so Martha Stewart. So it is a trademark, but it's also there's a publicity right, which means somebody else can't use her name without permission. Trademark. Well, I don't know, but I assume it is a registered trademark. It would be easy to find out. But there's, so there's two levels of protection, IP protection. One is a publicity right in a person's name uh, that extends beyond their deaths for a certain period. And there's also the trademark. But with respect to Maui Cookie Lady, I think we could have gotten that through. I mean, it, it's <laughs> three terms, but they're not generic. For, lady is not generic for cookie. Okay, and Maui, it's true under the federal system, it's geographic, so you, you have a five-year disclaimer, so, so you would have to disclaim that word. But th for the combination, cookie is generic, but I think we could have gotten that through, I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, it, certainly, uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, you have your protection now, right? Or you filed? Um, uh, filed and then got protection. Okay, so, so you're okay, yeah, but, um, you know, there's different, there's, there's always close calls, and different people have different opinions. Um, yeah. Okay, real quick. There's a very, some very complicated questions about mangoes and Pakistan specifically, so I'm going to advise this person to please contact the state, uh, uh, the ag people, or contact an attorney because it's a very, very specific question. Um, so there's another question I think we can answer. Um, that I, I've seen this before with on multiple islands when I've talked to people. Is it necessary to trademark or copyright a single T-shirt design saying logo, um, and should we do that at the state level as a trademark? I, I, I've actually seen this many, many times. So I, you, you want it? I don't understand the question. So the, the well, T-shirt says logo? No, no, no. It's somebody has a logo. That's really their business. that would be interesting. Is the logo. Yeah. And they're making T-shirts with it or caps. Right. So, so, so if you go back to what you learned earlier, a trademark is a designation of origin. So if that's your trademark, not just a one-off design on a T-shirt, then, then, then it should be registered as a trademark. If it's a one-off design for a T-shirt, then it's, it's copyright. However, the interesting thing with T-shirts and the trademark office is that if you have it large on the front of your shirt and it is your trademark and you file and use that T-shirt as a specimen, they will refuse it on what's called a doctrine of ornamentation. So when you ask, you know, what are the trouble marks, you know, that's, that's like a red flag for, for us guys who do it all the time. We know that if you come in with a trademark and it's emblazoned in the front, we're going to get a refusal. So we'll tell you, oh, let's make a label for it, for example. So oh, that's, that's one of the trick questions. Uh, no, now that's you a, know the trick answers. We, we this will be the final online question. And then if, any, if you have a, one last question, think about it before. Um, we have to give up this room very soon. Um, we touched on this a little bit. How do you suggest combating Chinese on a website stealing or using photos and designs? Um, and particularly, can, is, can the embassy in China help with that, or do you need local counsel, or how, how do you fight that? Because that seems to be, in the world of social media, which is increasing daily, it seems to be a big uh, problem. So, um it's a little out of my comfort zone, but basically there's there's several processes. One is the you know if you're if if you have a website and you have your photos on the website, you probably have some sort of statement on your website saying that those the all of the you know artistic works or photos or renderings on your website are protected under copyright, right? So there's usually some sort of um, legal disclaimer on those sites that indicate you know that you should not be copying and pasting and reusing those works um, without explicit authorization and permission of the right holder uh, from. So, and then there are other websites where uh, they only post uh, 
photos and, and, and images that are freely, freely used, right? But you're still accepting some sort of term, some sort of license agreement, um, whether it's free, uh, you know, open and free, or whether um, express permission is required. So, but if someone is using your images, then it goes back to this whole notice and takedown process um, that uh, oftentimes you can make those uh, claims of notice and takedown through whatever platform is hosting that service. Um, and then there are other mechanisms in the copyright realm that, that, uh, that again, are just out of my scope of, of understanding. But I don't know if you have anything to add. I was just going to add that unlike trademark infringement and patent infringement, copyright infringement can be both civil and criminal. And so depending on the scope of the copyright infringement that's going on, law enforcement might be something that uh, an agency that could help you. But, but not for small time, just for big time stuff. Okay, last two questions. In the back again, please. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't There's another can of worms coming. <laughs> I don't know if you already answered this, and it's a very like, simple uh, question, but what's the difference between, me, what's the difference between if, um, you know, you go to Long's and you go to buy Pinal, and then they have their brand, and then they have their brand. Generic, yeah. So it's just generic, so that's, how do you get away with that? Like, do the ingredients, I'm sure it's yeah. oftentimes, in most cases, what happens is the, the so the brand, you know, whether it be Tylenol or Advil, right? So those, you know, th those are the brand and the quality associated with the brand is one of the benefits of having a trademark is you know that um, that you're going to get something of quality, right? And then, but if the the patents for acetaminophen. Uh, if, if there were patents for acetaminophen, once they go off patent, um, means that the patent term has expired, then really that, um, the scope of that patent can now be uh, replicated by anyone. It goes into the public domain. And so the generic drug manufacturers start manufacturing that drug once it goes off patent. So that's what you're seeing is, you know, whether it's the store brand and then the, and then you look at it and the ingredients are completely the same. But what you don't know is, you know, was it manufactured to the same quality standards? Was, you know, it still might be 500 milligrams of whatever drug, but, you know, is it the absorption the same into your system? There's all these things where you, you that you don't know and you just kind of assume. Um, but, but you know what you're getting with uh, the brand name, right? And then you may be getting exactly the same thing. You may be getting a better quality or a lesser quality product with a generic. And there's a variety of different generics. And they sometimes are manufactured in the same plant. So it just, it depends. And what you'll, what you'll see is they'll say like, contains the same effective drug at dose as in Tylenol or similar to Advil or whatever. And, but so they're not, that's a fair use of the other, of the other mark. It's a fair use of the Advil mark or of the Tylenol mark. Um, but what they're not doing is they're not telling you they're Tylenol and they're not telling you that they're Advil. And that would, that's what, that would be infringement if they were to do that. Yeah, well, so there's, there's a fair use. You can, use. you can use certain marks without it being an infringement and, and that's considered fair use. So, so comparing your product to somebody else's product, the only way to do that is to use that other person's mark. And it's, it's free speech basically to compare yourself to someone else. As long, as long as you don't, you know, break the rules and say things that aren't true and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank Real quick. The last question, Rob. Thank you for doing what you've done <laughs> sure. for creating this. So, thank thank you. you, panel, for using your time to give us this free uh, lesson. My question is, uh, I, I heard you say that if you register your trademark, you have uh, six months to register on the Madrid Protocol. What if you've had a trademark for 25, 30 years and you now want to go and register in other countries? Can you still do it? Seth will correct me if I'm wrong, but let me try to answer it. So, um, so what, I, what I mentioned is when you file, right, if you file in the U.S., let's say, and then within six months you file your Madrid um, protocol, then it'll be as, we're in, and then when you file in those other countries, priority will be given to your first filing in the U.S. because it was within the U.S., right? Because uh, it was within six months. If you had a registration already, so you had the registration in force for a period of time, and then you file the Madrid to go into the other countries, the, the, you don't have priority back to the original filing, is how I understand it. Thank you. So, so yeah, so there's no time limit. 
The only, the only danger is somebody will file before you. So the six months just gives you, if somebody gets in between during that six months and you file within six months, you, you have priority over them. So it, it gives you a, especially if you launch, it gives you a six month period to get your funds and everything together for the foreign filings. You can still do it. You can still do it. Okay, everybody, we have to wrap it up. This has gone, uh, it's an excellent, excellent day. I'd like to thank very much our panelists, um, especially um, the two ladies flew over here just from Maui. I, let's give them a, another round of applause for being the entrepreneurs. Here's the MauiCookieLady.com, and then um, we have Rappley.com. Please check out their websites. I'd like to thank uh, John and Dan from coming from the mainland. And then if you have legal needs in the IP world, please think of giving Seth uh, and his firm your business and thank him for his valuable time. So again, thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. We'll see you soon.